so welcoming everybody more officially for the recording to the workshop on upskill. Oh, I should have the title really, shouldn't I? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to introduce Cara, who can introduce the workshop. It's about plots and charts. I'm just too excited to remember the title. I'm so sorry. So welcome to our conference workshop. I'm just going to deftly pass this over to Cara, who can introduce herself and the workshop today. And I'll just quietly be excited over here. <laughs> Great, thanks Zoe. That's actually a really nice introduction um, of, of the level of excitement. Um, hello everybody. Um, I can't see your faces but I can see your names and I'm really grateful that you've joined us today. Um, as Zoe said, I'm Cara, Cara Thompson. Um, I work as a data visualisation consultant, um, so I work with lots of different people um, and what gets me really excited is helping people make the most of graphs. Graphs are a brilliant tool to communicate insights from your data and they can be a really great shortcut to get people to understand really quickly what's going on. Um, so yeah, so we just posted the link um, to where my talk is on my website. If you lose track of the link, if you just go to my website, which is karaarthompson.com, go to the talks page, it's the first one there. Um, and the reason why I'm sharing it is that I've listed there the packages that we're gonna be using and a bunch of external resources as well, and um, particularly when it comes to accessibility and typography. Um, so there we go. Without further ado, um, I'm going to share my slide deck and uh, we can get started. So there we go. Can I get a quick thumbs up from somebody that we can see the slides? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Zoe. Um, and as we said, we'll try and keep an eye on the chat. I'll just pop it out there. If you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them in the chat. If I don't see it in the chat, uh, feel free to interrupt me. That's absolutely fine. Um, so we've got a good chunk of time together uh, and we're going to take our time. And the, the, my goal really is that by the end of this session, uh, you should have progressed in one of the plots that you're working on at the moment, or at least on the ideas that you're having around that plot, um, so that you can kind of see this as a, as a working session um, rather than just, just a workshop that you sit in. Um, passively. So yeah, it would be great to have you interacting with it. It would be great to have you trying things out um, as we go along. And if you want to share anything that you're working on um, in the chat, you can do that with a quick screenshot um, and we can talk about it. Um, again, remember that it's going to be recorded. So if you don't want it to be shared, then we can ask Zoe to blur that, to cut that bit out. Um, if we want to, that, that's absolutely fine. So the title of the workshop is Level Up Your Plot. Um, and we're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff um, around that. So hello again, uh, Cara Thompson. So how did I get here? Um, I started with a love for patterns in music and language. I grew up in a musical family in France. Um, so the whole thing of how the brain makes sense of noise was something that I, I found absolutely fascinating. And um, so I went on to do uh, music and psychology at uni and ended up doing a PhD in psychology where I was looking at how the brain reacts to funny things in sentences, such as the man buttered his bread with his socks. When you hit the word socks, your brain goes, oh, that wasn't right. Um, and the same thing happens in music. If you're running through a musical sequence and you hit a chord that doesn't belong in that key, your brain has a very similar reaction to it. So um, that was what I, I did for three years and, and loved it. Um, and from there, what I did is I used the um, stats and the analysis tools to go into the world of postgraduate medical exams, um, analyzing data of candidates sitting the exams and giving advice to those writing the exams on how to make them as good a measurement tool as we can. And um, having spent 10 years with the, with the surgeons doing that and learning that a, a graph is a great shortcut to communicating something complicated to people who are very clever, but also very busy. Um, I decided to branch out as a data viz consultant um, just to take that skill to other organizations. And one of the things that gets me really excited um, is helping other people maximize the impact of their expertise. Um, and so part of the joy is hearing you know, from other people in conferences and from clients what they're working on, how they're using R to make the lives of people around them better. And particularly in the context of the NHS conference, um, him making, making the lives of um, medical professionals, but also patients better. So as a patient, um, thank you for, for the work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's really great to see all the effort that you're, you're putting into using data really well. So today's goal is to equip you with some design tips and coding tricks to make the most of color and text uh, when you're creating your graphs so that we can make them as compelling and memorable 
as we can. Okay, we're going to look at how we can use colors to be less dependent on annotations. And we're going to spend a good amount of time on color because when, if you get the colors right, um, it can really be make or break in terms of how well people want to engage with your graph. You know, if you're looking at something and it's kind of painful to your eyes or to your sense of aesthetics, you might move on quickly. Whereas if you make it look nice, uh, then that's that's an advantage. And also if you make it so that the colors are more intuitive, people will remember what your graph is about much more easily. So we'll spend a good amount of time on colors. Then we'll look at how we can use color and different fonts to add some text hierarchy and to help people orient themselves really quickly when they're reading your title um, for your plot. Um, and then we'll apply all of the above to create some story enhancing annotations. So in plot annotations, uh, which again, I think are a brilliant shortcut to highlighting important things so that people can quickly get to grips with what's going on. We'll talk about packaging up reusable bits of R code. We won't cover package development per se, but we'll talk about how we can package stuff up as functions so that you can reuse them. Um, and we'll introduce you to some of the packages that I use a lot, um, which include ggtext and geomtextpath, um, just to facilitate that creation of in-plot annotations um, and to use all of the stuff that we've been talking about um, above that. If you uh, would like to share a plot with me, that would be great. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do some in-workshop feedback. Um, if you feel that you want to do that outside of the workshop, that's that's OK as well. Feel free to reach out. Um, I really, really enjoy um, helping people make their graphs better. So I'm happy to happy to give a bit of feedback there as well. A bit of housekeeping. Please ask for help. If you've got stuck, don't stay stuck. So you can, uh, if you're stuck on um, anything, put a message in the chat and I'll do my best to help you. If it ends up being something that's a bit more complicated than a quick back and forward in the chat, then we'll get Zoe back in um, and she can help troubleshoot things as well. And um, we're going to take regular breaks so that we can apply what we're learning to our own plots. Um, yeah, and if you get stuck or want to share some feedback, feel free to send me an email. Um, as well as hello at carrathompson.com um, should get you through to me. Um, throughout the coding uh, code chunks that I'm going to be sharing, I'm going to use namespacing. So that's when you use the package name, double colon, and then the function that you're using. And there's two reasons why I'm doing that. One, it keeps your code nice and clean. Um, so you, you'll probably be aware of packages that have the same functions inside them. And depending on the order in which you load your functions, you actually end up using a different function. Uh, the order in which you load your packages you can end up using a different function. So um, using this approach keeps your code a little bit safer, but I'm mostly doing it so that you can see where I've got each function from um, so that you don't have to install all the packages if you don't want to, if there's just one particular function that you're interested in. Um, choose your own pipe. Um, I alternate between the two. Um, I quite like the old one, just because there's, there's a few things that the old one does that the new one doesn't do. Um, so, but choose your own, that's absolutely fine. Um, and reuse as much of the code uh, as we're, that we're sharing here as you would like to. Um, I should point out there's a link at the bottom of the slides, um, which is just the link to the, the talks page uh, on my website. And this is the first talk. Um, I've got on here some of uh, the list of packages that we're going to be using and additional resources. Yeah, so when we go into the, the sessions where I'm getting you to do a bit of work on your own, um, feel free to have a look here. Um, at some of these resources if you want to use them, just so you don't have to scribble everything down uh, while, we're, while we're going through the, the presentation. So I think that's all the housekeeping done. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, and we're going to make a start on the actual content. So I talked about creating, picking the right kind of colors, creating color palettes that are intuitive for our readers. Um, if any of you have come from the world of psychology or linguistics, you might have come across this question before. Which one is Booba and which one is Kiki? Um, there's quite a big consensus that Kiki is this one, this spiky one over here, um, because of the way that the sound uh, maps onto the shapes. And this is something um, that was first talked about in 1929 with the notion of sound symbolism. And people are still looking into it today. Uh, so people are still trying to figure out exactly what it is that drives the phenomenon. But the, the, the illustration here is that we do have intuitive associations between sounds and visuals. Um, and I think we can harness some of that um, in the way that we create our plots so that we can figure out what visuals can we create that um, resonate well with the content that they're representing. 
So to illustrate this, we're going to play a quick game. Um, I'm going to ask you to suspend all disbelief and follow me on an adventure um, about what the Palmer Penguins got up to um, last weekend. So we're in the middle of the season. Uh, well, we've just kicked off the Bake Off, haven't we? We've had two episodes of the Bake Off so far. Big fan of Bake Off. Something very relaxing about watching people getting stressed about cakes. I don't know what that says about me, but anyway. Um, so we've got the, the Bake Off has started and the Penguins decided that they would run their race. Um, session of the Bake Off. Uh, they paired that they teamed up in their own species um, and had a competition to see who could bake the best banana loaf. So welcome to this first episode of the Great Penguin Bake Off. Um, so the penguins, as I said, had a baking competition to see who could make the best banana loaf and each species was given banana at a different level of ripeness. Uh, now in this graph I have um, totally misused the Palmer Penguins data set um, to pretend that the higher the bar, the yummier the cake is. Um, and if I were to ask you um, which species was given the ripe bananas, the underripe bananas, and the overripe bananas, um, you would have no way of telling. So I could add a legend into here. Um, that would be the right thing to do, um, I guess. But if we do this, um, then you already start to get an idea of which species was given the underripe bananas um, and which one was given the overripe bananas and which one's got the uh, the ripe bananas. So just to check that we're all on the same page, who got, can you type in the chat, A, B or C, who got given the underripe bananas? Yes, excellent, very good, a strong consensus, yes, perfect, you got it, right. So, this is a silly example, right? But follow, follow me on it because uh, it's it's worth doing. Just to, to illustrate um, something of what we're talking about here. So they decided to, um, within the Adelie penguin species, they were gonna experiment with different quantities of bananas in their mix. And each island chose a different quantity of bananas. So I'm gonna ask you which species chose uh, to include the strongest amount of uh, green banana in their mix. Again, A, B or C. Type it in the chat. Yep. Perfect. Very good. Excellent. Very good. 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 So, yeah, the strongest concentration of green bananas uh, is represented by the strongest amount of green colour um, in, in the plot. So, again, there's no legend, but you can start to guess what's going on. So, now we get on to uh, locations. So, they were allowed to go to a different location to plan um, their treats. Uh, some of them decided to go to city centre Paris. Some of them went on a ski resort. And some of them went to the lovely English countryside. Uh, which species went to a ski resort? A, B, or C? C, yes, excellent, very good. Um, and then this is gonna really be testing your, um, you know, uh, knowledge of the Bake Off and the, the mentors that we have, but they were allowed to choose a different mentor to take with them on their retreat. So some of them took Prue, some of them took Mary Berry, and some of them took Paul. Um, which species took Paul Hollywood with them? Yes, excellent. Very, very good. That grey hair and blue eyes stands out on the plot. <laughs> Didn't watch the Bake Off homework, Louise. That's okay. Don't worry. Um, this is all hopefully still going to make sense. I'll show you the pictures afterwards. Um, and then they decided to choose a different snack to use between the bakes. Um, so we've got some fish and chips, some sushi and some sardines. Which one decided to go for sushi? Again, A, B or C. Oh, more controversial this one. Yeah, B is the one that I was hoping for. Just that rice wrapped uh, is, is just what I was aiming for there. And then that's it, bonus round. Um, they decided to bake their cakes with different amounts of time. And here are the durations per species. Um, <laughs> yeah, yep, fair point, sorry, that's right. Um, so um, they decided to bake them for different amounts of time. Now, if you create a plot like this, time tends to run horizontally in my head. So then um, if you're looking at this and trying to figure out which one baked it for the longest, you, you start tilting your head um, a little bit. So the easiest way is to just flip that round um, and then you can instantly see um, that the, the Gentoo, uh, the C Gentoo's um, bake their cakes for less long um, than the rest of them. So that's the end of our episode of The Great Penguin Bake Off, um, which was 
completely silly and totally deliberately silly, but I have not lost the plot, pun totally intended. Um, this was to show us that we can use colour and orientation purposefully when we're creating our plots so that we can help people um, engage quickly with what's going on. You know, I didn't add the legends in, but you very quickly figured out which um, bar you should be looking at um, to, in answer to the questions that I was asking, which was encouraging. It works. Um, so let's get coding. We've, we've explored the principle of using colours symbolically, and yes, it was silly, and yes, it was probably a little bit too concrete. You're going to be going a little bit more abstract, probably, in the stuff that you're working on, and I'll share some examples of where we've done that um, as well. But we'll get coding, um, and then we'll revisit some colour ideas, and then I'm going to let you loose on your own plots um, to do the same thing. Um, throughout this first bit, we're going to be using the tooth growth data set, which is built into R. So if you use, if you've got R installed, you've got the tooth growth data set. Um, that means you can code along if you want. Um, it's quite intriguing. Somebody decided to feed guinea pigs vitamin C and orange juice and see how long their tooth teeth grew. So there we go. That's quite fun. Um, and it's also an excuse to use a cute gif of guinea pigs um, eating whatever they're eating leaves. Um, so let's get going and we'll create our first basic plot um, with uh, a few tips along the way. So you can see what we're doing here. Um, I've loaded up um, the type of the entire tidyverse, which I know Chris Bealy is not a huge fan of, but I've done it anyway. Um, and then you've got the tooth grade data set, which as I said, is built in. So if you just rerun this um, at your end, it, it should work. Um, and then grouping the data uh, by the supplement that they were given, which is orange juice or vitamin C, and by the dose of it that they were given, which I think is one, two, or half a milligram. Uh, then creating some summary, a summary data, so that um, <laughs> this dissent in Chris's team about loading the tidy verse. That's good to know. Um, so we've got the summary, uh, which is going to give us the mean tooth length within each of these groups, so the group of supplement and dose. Um, and then feeding these all into ggplot. So on the x-axis, we've got the dose. On the y-axis, we've got the mean length. And then I'm going to color the bars by the supplement that the guinea pigs were given. And we're just going to create a bar plot. So geom bar with stat equals identity because we're feeding it the length that we've got here. So let's see what that looks like. Ta-da! There we go. So this is our starting point. Um, a fairly basic plot, perfectly functional, but probably quite hard to read. Um, and it's not that easy to remember what's going on. So let's let's improve on it. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is position dodge. So I'm going to put the bars next to each other rather than stacked on top of each other because we're comparing two completely different conditions. It doesn't really make sense to, to stack them together. Um, and then I'm just going to add a bit of white around the bars because it makes them stand out a bit nicer. Um, so creating the, the color around the edge um, and setting the size of that contour to two. Um, and then first mini tip is to get rid of abbreviations. So it said SUP and it said OJ and VC. We're going to make that supplement and orange juice and vitamin C. Um, it just reduces a little bit of the cognitive load involved in processing a graph if you can give people actual words to, to read, because that's what we're used to reading. So that's all we're doing here. We're creating, we're using mutate to create an extra column in the, the data. Um, and where it says orange juice, uh, OJ, we're saying orange juice, where it says VC, we're saying vitamin C. And then um, true is just the catch-all for anything that didn't meet the conditions above. So hopefully there shouldn't be anything that fits in that, but just in case, we're going to um, create the, uh, just reuse whatever it was that was in SUP, just to be on the safe side so you don't end up translating stuff that you shouldn't. Um, we then need to just update the fact that we're grouping by supplement and no longer by SUP. Um, and we need to create the fill um, so that it's um, supplement as well. And there we go. So all this has done is it's updated our uh, legend, but still worth doing. Um, it's quite small there on the slide, I appreciate, but at least we've got real words. Um, so there we go. first mini tip, get rid of abbreviations when you're doing that. Second mini tip, theme minimal, just get rid of the gray background. Um, I don't know why the ggplot default has the gray background on it, but some people some people really like it, some people don't. Um, I actually do quite like having a little background to um, plots when I'm creating them for clients. Uh, just it, it's worth doing so that it's not just too stark a contrast, um, but uh, gray is nobody's favorite color. Um, so get rid of the, the theme minimal, uh, get rid of the background with theme minimal, 
Um, and then we're just going to turn the dose into a factor. So all that does is it just evens things out along the x-axis. Um, because we're just looking at three different conditions. We're not actually comparing the, the values per se. Um, so there we go. We've... And then I'm going to split them up. So I'm going to use facet wrap um, to create one set of graphs related to the orange juice, uh, well, one set of bars related to the orange juice, one set of bars related to the vitamin C, uh, just to make it a little bit easier to, to see what's going on. Um, and then we need to add some text. So we're adding in um, the... Uh, we're changing what the axes are, again, just to make it plain English. Um, and we're adding in a title and we've got a subtitle. Uh, so that kind of spans across the, the code there, but that's that's okay. Um, and I see Zoe's posting in the chat um, where you can find the code. So yeah, if you, if you go to the talk, um, you can very easily copy paste the code uh, from the slides. If you see, if you hover over the code bit, there's a little clipboard that appears. And if you copy that, you, you can paste it wherever you want to. Um, so we've got a legend, a facet strip, color, title, a perfectly functional graph with all the information in it that we need to show about our study. But I find myself looking at this and feeling a little bit like this kitten. Like, what? Wait, 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 which one's which? How do I, wait, 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 which one's on top? Which one's on the bottom? How do they compare? Uh, yeah, it's not that easy. Uh, so let's, let's improve it um, with some of the stuff that we've just been talking about. So using color purposefully. I really like starting from a photo, um, a photo or a piece of art um, I find great just because someone else has gone to the trouble of finding good color combinations and if I like the look of the photo and the way the colors work together in that then I'm likely to be able to reproduce something of that in the graph. So um, orange juice is orange, that's great. Vitamin C is also orange um, but it's a bit more aggressive and a bit more red uh, and so we can try and make that happen um, with our uh, graph as well. And the green leaves look quite nice with those colors. So that's probably a good starting point for some text and um, so that we've got a nice little bit of contrast. Obviously, we're not going to go with the white green, uh, but I'll show you how we do that um, in a minute. And then I like to use a site, site called imagecolorpicker.com. And um, what it allows you to do is if you copy an image and then go to the site, then you can say, use your own image paste it in um, and then you can start poking around in it and extracting the colors that you want to use. Uh, there are many, many, many tools for doing this, uh, but this is just the one that I tend to tend to go to um, just because I find it quite intuitive to use. Uh, but if you have another one that you like using, um, then, then go for that as well. Let me just copy um, oh, the link into the chat um, and then we can can refer back to that as well. So I like starting from a photo and picking out the colors that I'm gonna use, but then we wanna modify them a little bit. Okay, so we've got um, a great color palette and we're gonna start with the orange juice color, which I just picked from the glass of orange juice, which is called Fab 909, which I think is, is a great name. But, you know, if you're gonna go for a fun hex code, that's good. Um, and then using a package called Monochroma, which is one that I created um, to generate an extra color. Um, so we've got, I picked out another color from the um, that photo, which was a darker orange from the side of one of those oranges. And I'm gonna blend in some red um, and create three colors. And then I can have a quick look and see, okay, is that this one in the middle here looks nice and vitamin C-ish. You know, those packets of vitamin C where you can almost taste the, the aggressive nature of the stuff inside, um, that's good. Then I use monochroma again um, to use one of the green leaves. Um, so I fed in the green leaf color um, and again said go darker, um, which gives me uh, this darker color here, which is a, oops, oh, uh, let's go back. Yes, it works. Um, so that's just a very dark green um, that's almost black. Um, and there's a lot of, um, stuff out there about not using pure white and pure black in visuals because it can be a bit overwhelming and um, particularly for people with different um neurodivergences so it's worth um worth thinking about that it's just a very very dark green um, and then i'm taking that very dark green um here and going lighter to create a few lighter text variants that we're going to use in our plot as well so hopefully everybody's still with me um, all I've done is used a color, picked out some key colors that, used a photo, picked out some key colors that I liked, and then modified them using uh, monochroma. Um, 
And this is what I suggest we use as our vitamin C palette for now. Um, those of you who've used Melnochroma before might have spotted an update that I've made to it, which is now that it includes the names of the colors if you used a name vector um, in the output, which is useful. And it's also quite fun that it shows you that, yes, obviously you shouldn't put black text on very, very dark green because you will not be able to see that. Uh, and we'll come back to that uh, later when we talk about accessibility. But these are the colors that we're going to use. Um, and again, this is all on the slides on the website. And let's just add them in. So we're back to the basic plot that we had created. And we're going to add the colors in. So um, the quick and easy way to do that is to just use scale fill manual values equal. And then you just pop in the colors that we had chosen. So we remember we said that we liked Fab 909 for the orange juice. And then I'm not going to try and pronounce this one because it's just uh, a string um, for the, the vitamin C. Uh, now, in theory, that's fine. But um, the trouble with that is that uh, it's open to things going horribly wrong. So say you've gone away on holiday and you've come back and your colleague says, oh, um, I realized actually supplement should have been a factor um, and you had it as a character string. So I've just gone and fixed that for you. And you come back and you rerun your plot and uh, suddenly the colors have flipped around. So you've got vitamin C. Um, has become the orange juice color and orange juice has become the vitamin C color. Um, and that's because when we just feed these values in like this, um, it just assigns them um, in whatever order the data comes in. So um, that's a little bit dangerous to do. I uh, don't recommend doing that, but the way to get around that problem is to use a named vector instead. Um, so if we use the vector um, that I had created earlier, that vitamin C palette, you remember we had orange juice equals a hex code, vitamin C equals a hex code. And that means that no matter what your colleague does in terms of um, uh, factors and orders of factors in your absence, um, everything just stays nice and stable and in the right place. So now we've got vitamin C, we've got the orange and they've got the right colors assigned to them um, because that named vector is making sure um, that it, it keeps track. So it's worth doing that for the safety of your plot. I would say if you're using the same color palette across a bunch of plots, which is always worth doing, if you've got several plots about the same thing, no point reinventing the wheel, and um, using that named vector, again, will give you that consistency across your reports, across your documents. Um, and all you've done, you know, you've created an object in R, you could easily add that into a package. Um, if you like creating packages for your own team, um, that would be nice and easy to do. I've done that for myself because I can never remember what my brand colors are. So I've got Cara R templates, double colon colors, and it gives me all the stuff that I need to know about, about that, which is which is very useful. Um, so key advantages, as I said, know that the colors are applied to the right data points and um, keep the colors consistent throughout your project. And you can package it up as a default palette, and then you can easily reuse the colors in the text, uh, which we're gonna do later in this workshop if we're using uh, GG text and Markdown for, for our title. So um, we need to get rid of unused colors, uh, but actually that's fine. For some reason it hasn't pulled them in. So um, if you end up with a long named vector, sometimes you can have extra colors appear um, in your legend. Um, if that happens to you, the, uh, the trick is to use limits equals force. Um, and then that only includes in the legend, the colors that you're actually using. In your graph, um, depending on how things are set up, sometimes you end up with the you know the full set of the colors that you're using for your text and other stuff that you're not using in that particular graph. Um, I'm then going to use um, alpha, so the transparency, to indicate the the dose um, of the the orange juice or the vitamin C that is given. Um, and using this again is quite useful, but we need to make sure that we don't let it go too far because we cannot see that lighter bar um, properly enough. So uh, we're just going to set the range of the alpha, so the range of the transparency. Um, and then that means that it just keeps it um, all nice and visible, which is good. So we've got that sorted. Um, we're then going to uh, label our scale because we don't want to have to keep looking up what the unit is. Um, and it makes a lot more sense to label it. So all we're doing here is creating a little function that takes in the breaks and it pastes the break with milligrams per day, which is the unit that our data set tells us um, we are using. So uh, we've got the dose down here, we've got milligrams per day. I appreciate the text is quite small, but trust me, it's there. Um, 
and it's added in uh, the legend for transparency, which we'll get rid of later uh, because the legend itself is redundant. Uh, we've The colors are only really for decoration and they're already mentioned in the facet strips. We're gonna make that easier to read um, in a minute, but we don't need a legend. Um, and a lot of the work that I do in the consulting and feeding back on people's plots is asking that question, do you need that bit of text? Do you need that legend? Uh, and we'll play a quick game of that later as well today. And the last thing I'm gonna do, uh, I mentioned earlier that um, you know time goes horizontally. Uh, I found that I found it less confusing looking at the plot this way around in terms of growth, maybe because growth happens over time. Uh, that's maybe what's going on in my head there. I'm not sure, uh, but I flipped the plot and uh, just using chord flip, which is again a very handy function. If you create everything and you think it looks really good, um, and then you think you're putting your head to one side too much to read it, uh, chord flip is your friend. It's also really useful. Um, if you end up having long uh, names along one of the axes that just don't fit next to each other at the bottom of the axis. Again, rather than putting your labels you know, coming up the way or at a slight angle to make them all fit, consider flipping your plot on its side um, and then that gives you more room to play with in terms of where, uh, where the labels fit. So there we go, chord flip. And let's compare where we've got to. So I think this is much clearer already than our first functional plot. It contains all the same information. And it's the power of color um, to make it a little bit more intuitive what's going on. Uh, we've been able to get rid of the legend, which removes something to read. Um, and I think it's easier to compare. Uh, this is quite hard to compare how high the bars are compared to each other, but looking up and down it um, is much easier to do that way as well. So. There we go, we've got our first uh, first bit of using color and orientation purposefully. I'm gonna hand over to you very shortly so you can have a go at doing this, at picking out some colors um, and applying them to your own plots. Hopefully you've got plots, either you've got a plot in your head that you're working on um, or you've got actually some code with you uh, that you can, you can manipulate. But before I let you loose on it, just a few tips on picking colors because um, it's I find it's really hard to do. Uh, so I thought I would share how I overcome that. And the first thing to remember is about making it easier to remember what's what. So you might not have something that objectively has a color, um, but if you can keep that consistency, um, that's going to help people as well. And picking colors is really hard, so let others help you. Um, as I said, I quite like using photos for a starting point, but you might have some brand guidelines. So your department might have already um, got something together that gives you a set of colors that you're to use in your plots and that's great. Um, the question is whether you have to stick exactly to those colors or whether you can use those as a foundation to then start manipulating them um, so that you can harness some of that color um, color semantic pairing that we've been doing um, just now. Um, I like to use a photo and something like imagecolorpicker.com to pick out some colors. Um, and that's what I did in our uh, episode of The Great Penguin Bake Off. Uh, these are all the photos that I used um, to create the bars. So you can see where the colors came from. Um, and yeah, it was quite fun doing that. Um, I tend to find as well, if you like the look of a photo, then it's probably because you like the way that the colors combine with each other. Um, so try and find a photo that you really like as your starting point, rather than just a photo of the thing that you're trying to, trying to talk about. Because um, that'll make your life a lot easier going forward. Um, I also did it for, uh, it can be a bit more abstract. So this is something that I did for a project where people were looking at uh, video ratings based on whether the video was entirely uh, generated by a computer or whether it was entirely human made. And so I created a, a machine color and a human color and then blended between the two because they also had a, a middle condition. And so again, this isn't, um, you know, concrete stuff. I, I was going for that kind of pinky orange brain color um, and that blue steel color. And if nothing else, it made me chuckle a little bit um, in hoping that your plots are not going to be twisted and, and evil. Um, but you can harness that kind of slightly more symbolic color um, semantic pairing if you're not using something concrete. Um, I did this again for a different client, looking at great growth. So things that grow into be nice and green, sales, money, coins, gold. Um, and then loss, a kind of purpley, slightly more murky color, um, which was all tied in with the, the client's brand, uh, which was recast. Um, and then this is a photo that I used for another project with a client who was uh, based in British Columbia. Um, and he was creating a dashboard. So you've got 
the view from the mountaintop, uh, which was the kind of gold stuff. You had the older system sitting in the shadows. You have the the lake, um, which was and, and the sky, kind of the overall view, um, and then the new system, which were, which was green. So again, you know, it's it's less direct a comparison, but once you've clocked it, it's easy to remember where you're going. And take inspiration from photos or other data viz and art that you like. If you don't have any obvious pairings, that's okay. And um, this is one of the favorite, my favorite plots that I've made. And I realized that last year's conference that it was more recognizable than my face, which is probably a win. Um, but all the photos from this are taken from, uh, all the colors in this graph are taken from this photo. Uh, you've got a bit of the tent, you've got a bit of the frosting, you've got quite a lot of priest shirts. And um, just if some, you know, if someone's gone to the trouble of designing a shirt where the colors work really well together, um, then why not make the most of that um, and, and pull that into a plot? Um, and this is a project that I worked on uh, for a client to create a data viz design system, um, which she was using, creating lots of different plots um, and was creating them about lots of different things, but wanted an anchoring in colors that were feminine, but not sickly sweet. She was looking at gestational diabetes. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so that's the, these are the colors that we've created, which are all taken from um, this painting by Leon Morocco. And again, imagecolorfigure.com uh, was a useful starting point for that. You can also use Google Images and Google, you know, whatever you like palette. Uh, so sunflower palette or peacock palette or whatever it is that you, you think might give you something nice. Um, I tried it with the Edinburgh palette and there's a company called the Color Palette Company. You can try typing in your own uh, city and see see what comes out for the Birmingham. Uh, the conference was in Birmingham uh, last last time I was there, um, and it was quite fun having a look at what the Birmingham palette was and seeing if the people, the local people, agreed um, with the the palettes that were there. Um, but yeah, there's loads of different tools, and the last one that I'm going to talk about is uh, Paliton. If you'd like starting from scratch, um, that's fine. You can do that. Um, uh, I recommend using Paliton um, to do that. Let me just pop the link. Um, into the chat. Uh, oh, tried to send that to Zoe instead of to everybody else. There we go. Um, so what this allows you to do um, is say, I want four colors, um, and then you can move it around um, and it will give you four colors. Um, now, initially when I started working colors, I thought, right, here's the formula, just make them as far apart with each other, from each other as you can. Um, and it will look great. Actually, it doesn't, it looks like a primary school, um, which is fine if that's the aesthetic that you're going for, go for it. Um, but actually, if you have the colors a bit closer together, and I think they have a default um, of 30 that they use, um, you get slightly more mature color palettes um, that, that work quite well. Um, and then it has uh, various color line simulations that you can, you can try um, to see how that looks um, to people who have different color perception from us. And again, uh, we'll come back to accessibility um, after we've done this. So uh, for viewing your colors, you can use monochroma view palette if you want to do that. Um, and if you view them with a named vector, it now pulls in the names that you have created, um, which is worth doing. Um, blah, 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 where are we? Okay, a few more things, and then I will, I promise I will hand it over to you so that you can uh, get going with this. For the terminology, hue, saturation, and value. Hue is what you think of as what color is it? Saturation, I think of as how colorful is it? How red is that red? And value, how light is it? Or how transparent is it um, in our cases sometimes? So you can manipulate colors quite nicely uh, for amounts. We've already talked about that using the transparency um, to show how much of the green banana was included in the, the banana loaf. Um, I've used it for cumulative effects as well, when people wanted to see the, the total as well as the underlying bars. It can be quite a nice way of trying to capture that. Um, I also quite like uh, manipulating the colors for recency. So if I ask you which line here shows the most recent data, um, I'm just going to flip this backwards and forwards because I feel that's what the plot is doing. Okay, so you, you barely have time to get from the legend to the top and then you're back trying to figure out which line is the most recent one. Um, my recommendation for that is to kind of go gray. So we're going to use a slightly lighter green. Um, and so the most recent color is the, the most prominent one. Uh, you can 
take away a bit of the saturation. So we've downed the value, we've downed the saturation. And if you combine the two, it kind of ends up going gray, which I think is quite a fun way of showing the stuff that is older in the data set is a bit grayer than the stuff that is more, re more recent. So again, if you're looking at comparing things across years, um, it's going to be quite a useful way of doing that. And again, uh, you can use monochrome to do that, um, which I've since turned into a shiny app. Um, which you can have a play around with if you want to. Let me just pop that into the chat. Uh, but say you have a starting color, go lighter, or you can use a blend color, and uh, say the gray 50, and however many colors you need um, to manipulate that as well. So hopefully a useful tool uh, that you can play around with when you're having a look at your colors. So. Final color hack, test it out with the text and the background. Um, if you write your text in over the top of a uh, background color to see if it does the, the right thing for you, um, it can alert you to the fact that you've not, in this case, picked a very relaxing color. Um, I was working with a client who had a lot of traffic light coding in their tables and their plots, and they'd gone for this default CSS green for everything as well. This does not say to me all as well. Um, this does, you know, if you Google, Calm green, um, you will come up with colors like this, and then you can change the text as well. Um, and again, monochrome can help you visualize the name of the color on top of the, the color in the background. So that was a lot of information, and there's a lot to talk about when it comes to colors, but hopefully that's just given you some tips that you think, oh yes, that one is relevant to me, or that one's more relevant to me, or I hadn't thought about that. Um, and so now's the time for you to take 10 minutes um, and have a look at your plots or have a think about the plots that you're working on um, and see if you can come up with some colors that work really well together and extract them from photos or have a look at Paliton if you prefer starting from scratch um, and then see what they look together like together using monochroma view palettes. And if you've named them, see if you feel that the name resonates with the color that you've picked as well. So um, I'm going to set the timer uh, for 10 minutes. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'm going to stick around, but I'll turn my video off while you're working on this. So on your marks, get set, bake. Oh no, I went for nothing. Okay, I will, uh, in that case, keep your rights and I'll, I'll tell you when there's just a minute to go. Uh, but have fun working on your colors and uh, I'll see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, everyone, you have about a minute left to play with colors. It goes fast when you're, um, yeah, you can, you can, ten, you can spend um, a ridiculous amount of time playing with colors. So I thought I would make sure um, that we don't spend too much time on it. And you can always go back and revisit stuff at a later stage if you want to. Okay, let's Let's call that a day for now when it comes to colours. Hopefully you had sorry, hopefully you had a chance to have a look at that. Um and we're gonna do a wee bit more on colours just now, um, because there's a few more things to bear in mind, um, and then we'll start moving on to manipulating our text. So a few things to bear in mind when we're working with colours. Um you'd all be aware um of accessibility when it comes to colours. And um, we'll spend a bit, we'll come back to that um, in just a minute and how to design colours. To choose colors that are going to work for people um regardless of uh, differences in visual perception um but it's more than just red and green um and we'll, we'll come back to that shortly um so we've got things to bear in mind accessibility and um, you can test what things look like you can simulate different levels of color blindness you know using a package called color blinder and um, it's not available on cran uh, but it's available on github um, and if you go to again the, the talk um, page on my website so you can follow the instructions for how to install that um, yeah using remote so there's a, a few other things to, to bear in mind so have a look at the instructions on the github page related to that package as well if you're interested in using that uh, but what it allows you to do is feed the latest plot that you've created into um, this colorblind grid um, and it then creates um, plots that are a simulation of what that looks like. So the latest thing that we created in this presentation was actually um, just a set of colors used created, in, uh, created using monochroma. So um, that's what it's created here for us. It simulated what those colors look like um, when they're desaturated or when they, they're applying different types of color blindness to it. Um, it's a, it's a very handy tool. And the other tool that I recommend using quite a bit is uh, colorcontrast.cc. And um, so what this does is um, takes you to a website where you can say, OK, my background color is white. Um, and my foreground color, let's go for that um, Fab 909 color that we had for the orange juice. And here we can see it fails across the board um, as, a, as a color. And um, so then you can manipulate it, make it less light um, and play around with it until it passes. Um, yeah, so the classes. If you're using it in the title, um, then you're looking really at large text and normal text, so you can get away with with failing on the last one there. Uh, but if you want to be super careful, um, and it's text that people need to be able to read, that's small text, um, then you want to make sure that you're picking quite a dark color so that it works well. So colorcontrastchecker.cc, uh, colorcontrast.cc, um, works really really well for that. Um. So accessibility, uh, obviously, if you're using colors in your plots and talking about different race and ethnicity groups, you want to avoid any stereotypes or unintended messages. Um, one that I, I try to remind people of is if, say, your company logo is green um, and you make um, white people in your graphs the green group, um, then you're potentially having an unintended message about which group is most related to your brand color or which group is most important in your graphs, et cetera, et cetera. So just have it, be really mindful of the way that you do that. And if you're reusing colors from elsewhere, uh, which, which groups you, you pair them with. Um, and also uh, the other thing that's quite useful is that notion of intensity, more is more. 
Um, if you're using something to highlight, for example, um, access to electricity, and you've got a really light green color to symbolize electricity, you might want to think about flipping your plot into dark mode so that that the more intense the light color um, stands out against a darker background. So again, just some some tips and tricks to bear in mind. Uh, but coming back to accessibility, as I said, it's more than about red and green. <laughs> Excuse me, still recovering from a cough last week. Um, the most recent issue of um, the Nightingale magazine um, had a big section on um, accessibility and plots. I highly recommend getting hold of this um, if you can, just on the Theta Visualization Society website. And so I'm going to capture some of the stuff that was in that section in our workshops so that you can refer back to it when you rewatch the video um, or um, when you're working on your next plot. So, Color perception differences, there are lots of different ones. So we always we always think about red and green, but actually some people struggle with green, some struggle with red, some with blue, and some with combinations of the two. So um, just factoring in red and green isn't really gonna be enough to make sure that it works for everybody. Um, and accessibility is more than just color, it's also about neurodivergent audiences, uh, which account for 10 to 15% of the global population. Um, and there are a bunch of different things that fall into um, that grouping, uh, which is quite uh, a useful, helpful term when we're thinking about how do we make sure that our plots work well for, for everyone. Um, and the case for designing first uh, with accessibility is that it makes it better for everyone. Um, it's less visually overwhelming if you follow some of these principles um, of using color minimalism and um, it makes it easier to read. We're going to manipulate text and fonts in the, the next workshop that we're the next session where I'm letting you these on your own plots. Um, and uh, it makes the main thing the main thing. You add some visual hierarchy into it. Um, and it also makes everything more environment proof. So you've probably been in a situation where you've created a graph and it looks great, and then you go to present it at a conference and it just doesn't look nice on the screen. And um, sometimes it's to do with pixelation or if you're sending somebody a poor quality screenshot of something to test it out. Um, if somebody in your team wants to take something and print it out in black and white or a journal only publishes in black and white, you need to make sure that you factor that in as well. Um, and as I said, it just, it makes it a bit more environment proof in terms of the quality of projections that you're using as well. So it's about accessibility, but it also makes it better for everyone and for all the circumstances in which you're using it. So the tips that they recommended in that section of the Nice and Gap magazine uh, was to, to do with color. So try to use shades of the same color rather than lots of different colors where appropriate. Um, so you don't necessarily need five different colors if you've got five data points. How many colors do you actually need? Um, and how can you minimize the number of different colors that you're using? The, the palette on tool that I shared earlier is quite nice to get little variants of the color um, as well. They suggest working with muted colors rather than stark colors. So that bright green CSS, um, you know, the default green that I showed earlier uh, is not particularly relaxing to look at. Whereas if you mute it, um, it makes it a lot easier. And actually, if you're combining colors, using something like monochrome or some of the palette tools that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, you often get muted colors anyway, so that works really well for us. Um, in terms of typography, we're going to talk about that in a minute, making sure that our text is nice and readable. Visual hierarchy, making sure that we signpost really easily what to look at, which is why we're going to talk about the title and the in-plot annotations. Um, and then patterns, you know, if you're using something to symbolize something, try to use it consistently across your, uh, your work. But I kept getting really concerned about this whole thing about color contrast and the contrast with the background, because often when you're creating a color palette, it's really difficult to get a palette where all of the colors have that three to one ratio, uh, which is mentioned in the, the guidelines for a meaningful graphic. But as this quote says, that is mathematically impossible for any palette containing just a small number of colors. So I found that really reassuring to, to read. And where I've landed in the work that I do is that we do the best that we can to make sure that the colors um, that we've chosen with the accessibility criteria in mind, we've tested them in terms of how they look to people with different um, color blindness variations. Uh, but we make sure that the colors themselves are distinct from each other uh, for a range of audiences. So that I found really reassuring as a quote to find somebody saying, this is the guideline, it's mathematically impossible if you're creating a color palette. So here is, here is the compromise um, that we can use. 
and um, we can test it out. So one of the things that um, that we looked at was the traffic lighting system. Can we create a traffic light system that works? And um, for the most part, it works regardless of what um, what color blindness we we've, we've got. Harder to tell the difference when it's desaturated, uh, but still was quite quite useful. Um, but the thing that really struck me that I hadn't really thought of is red on uh, black text on red is really difficult to see, uh, which I hadn't noticed at all until I fed this through. Um, and you can see that it's, it's totally disappeared um, here. Very, very difficult to see. So again, that's where the, the color contrast checker tool comes in very handy. And here's a color palette that I'm working on at the moment for a client. Um, and you can see the, what the original looks like and then the color blindness simulations underneath that, um, which again, works quite well. And part of the trick there is going from light to dark to light again, um, and using a bit of light and dark variance as well as using color variance in your palette choices. Um, and the tool that I use to do that is this tool here, viz4.net slash palettes. Um, and if you go there to that website, what it allows you to do is feed in a few anchor colors here and then increase the number of colors that you need. And then you can check the simulations to see what it looks like. But it also gives you a little tick if it thinks that, that it's OK. So that's a really useful tool. And I've put a link to that um, on the, the page associated with this talk um, as well. Um, so you can interpolate between your anchor colors. And then you can tweak your anchor colors as well. Say you want to make the, the darker one even darker so that it works better. You can do that. And it will remember the hex codes and feed them back to you so that you can then creates all the palettes that you need. Um, and as I said, my top tip is to go for light and dark contrast as well as going for variations in hue. And um, so this is the one that I use for that database design system that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are my anchor colors. These are the anchor colors that I used for a different client um, who, yeah, we just used uh, stuff from Van Gogh's paintings um, as, a, as a basis for, for his stuff, which was quite fun. In testing the colors in and of themselves is fine, but they might look different when they're used in a graph. So some people have put together tools that help us do this. Um, and this, again, is another one that I have um, created, that I've linked to, created by Alicia Meeks and Susie Liu. Um, and what you can do with this one is change the, the color palettes that you, the colors that you've got in here, and then it will create a bunch of graphs for you so that you can see if you were to use these colors in a graph, would it, would it work? Um, and then again, across the top, you can change uh, the, the color blindness simulations that you're using. So again, well worth having a look at um, if, you're, if you're creating your own palettes from scratch. Sometimes you want to see what it looks like with your real graphs. So you can obviously use Color Blinder to do that. Um, the other option is to use an online tool. So again, uh, the DeltonLens.org one is quite good. And uh, you can upload a photo or a screenshot um, to the just an image. That's what I mean, isn't it? Yeah, just upload an image to the website, um, and then you can you can check the color blindness um, that goes on there. So as I mentioned earlier, text and color contrast. Um, again, something that I hadn't really thought about, but that black text on red background um, is is not something that works. So if you're using um, red and green and dark, you know, red and green as a traffic light system. If you're using red as a background, you probably want to make sure that you're using white text instead, and um, because it stands out better for everybody. Actually, when you look at it, even when you look at it down here, um, the white text is much easier to read than than the black text is. So there we go, a bunch of extra things to, to think about. And um, here is a color contrast cheat sheet, uh, which is useful when you're looking uh, for how text should compare to its background and how buttons should compare to their background as well. Um, and this is one that was put together by Oliver Schunder for Pimp My Type. Um, again, a very useful cheat sheet. And his website has a bunch of useful resources for designing things, particularly if you're thinking of designing dashboards. Um, have a look at his user interface uh, design workshops. They're really, really good. So there we go. Those are the extra things to think about. Um, thankfully, a lot of tools exist to do that for us. So we've mentioned the color contrast um, checker, which we've used earlier, um, and it will tell you if you've passed or failed on the different criteria. So you don't really have to remember those criteria, um, but it's just worth worth thinking about um, and knowing what they are. So I'm going to hand over to you again, this time uh, just for five minutes, um, to have a look at the colors that you've come up with and check them, um, either with the Viz Palette Checker or with the Color Blinder um, Grid. 
Um, see if you need to change your text and uh, if you're going to be using text on top of them, have a think about that. Um, and then see if there are any surprises when you run a simulation on your own graph um, and anything that you hadn't thought of or anything that comes up slightly different. Um, so again, the link to the resources is available um, on the talks page. Um, and I'm going to give you five minutes to have a look at this. Again, come back to me with any questions in the chat or over email. I'm happy to, to answer them um, as we go. And if anyone has anything they want to share when we come back from these five minutes about how they've got on, that would be wonderful. So there we go. Oh, the timer works this time. Great. So five minutes uh, just to have a look at color blindness simulations on your, own, uh, on your own data and your own colors. See you in a bit.
Okay, that's us at the end of another five minutes. Um, I hope you've had a chance to play around with your colours. Um, does anyone want to pop anything in the chat about how they got on or speak out or raise a hand or any sign of life <laughs> that you're still here and enjoying the workshop uh, with the greats? And a few people had to had to drop off, so hopefully they'll be able to, to come back and get, catch the end of it. Or if not, obviously they'll get the, the message as well. And that'll be fine. Good stuff. Okay, I will. Okay, good. Thank you, Francesca. That's that's really kind. That you're enjoying the workshop. That is good. Um, so yeah, I will take no news as good news. Otherwise, um, and assume that if you have got stuff on something or if something doesn't make sense, that you will will reach out. Um, because yeah, I, I would hate for you to leave here not having uh, felt that you got what you wanted out of the workshop. So we played with some color. Um, and I talked about text, so we're going to move on to text now and add a bit of text hierarchy to our graphs. So text hierarchy is one of those things that it is so much easier to demonstrate than it is to um, explain. Have a look at this image here. And what this is showing you is that there are some bits of text that you are naturally going to gravitate to and some bits of text that you're going to completely ignore based purely on how the text has been formatted. Um, and when we're creating our plots, we want to be the ones who are in control of what, um, what's really important for the readers to have a look at and what doesn't matter quite so much. So um, we're going to have a look at how we can improve the text hierarchy in our plots so that the main thing stands out, so that there's stuff that kind of goes gets pushed to the side a little bit attention-wise that people can come back to if they want more clarity on something. Um, and just so that we are in control of the narrative um, and of what people end up looking at first when they're looking at our plots. So uh, let's see how we do that. It's time to start playing around with theme uh, within ggplot. So those of you who have created a lot of ggplots, um, I, it took me quite a long time of creating ggplots before I realized quite how much you could manipulate them using uh, the theme. Um, and I think for me, a big part of discovering this was taking part in the Tidy Tuesday challenge on Twitter. Uh, we, since Twitter um, has gone uh, in a different direction from the one that we hoped it was going to go in, um, a lot of our people have left Twitter. So it's not quite as active a community there as it used to be, which is sad. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's good to see that people are transferring onto LinkedIn and other platforms as well to do this. So the Tidy Tuesday Challenge is still alive and it's still doing well um, and highly recommend it as a way of playing around with data because it's always data where you can't really put your foot in it. You know, if you, if you get it wrong, no one is going to be basing their life uh, decisions on your plot, um, which, is, which is good. It's stuff like, you know, ratings of coffee and coffee competitions or pets that got lost in Brisbane or, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, Louise is asking if Tidy Tuesday is on LinkedIn. Um, those of us that do the Tidy Tuesday and who are on LinkedIn are, are posting it with the hashtag. Um, so you should be able to find us there as well. And it does get posted across platforms. Um, so hopefully, uh, if more and more of us um, take part in it, uh, Louise, I'm going to include you in that group, um, then, then that'd be good. It'll increase the visibility of it. Um, and you create, you end up creating a whole bunch of goofy plots that you would never put in an academic publication. But what it does teach you is how to manipulate absolutely everything that is tied to a GG plot. Um, so that you can, once you know how to manipulate it, you can choose whether to do it or not, right? Um, but it's a, it's a really great uh, playing ground for, for learning how to do that. So um, let's have a look at this and see what we can do to make our theme better. And um, we've got the basic plot that we created earlier. Um, and all I'm doing here is I'm saving it as an object called basic plot, which is this. Uh, and I'm doing that so that all of that code we can kind of forget about and just focus on the code that I'm manipulating in changing the, the plot. So we're going to start with basic plot plus, and then we're going to start manipulating the theme from there. So let's, let's do it. Um, we already said earlier that we can get rid of the legend. So we're going to say legend position equals none. We don't need the legend. It's redundant. Um, in this plot because the colors are already specified um, that they're tied to the facets um, and they're tied to the information that's in the axis as well. So the plot, the legend is not adding any extra information that we don't already have. Um, next, I'm going to change the color palette. So you remember when we created our vitamin C palette, we had some text color um, and we had a light text color and we had a dark text color. So I'm going to say 
So all of the text, we're going to default to the light text color that we had. Um, and then I'm going to change the title color so that it's the dark text. Now appreciate this is subtle, and especially over Zoom, it's subtle. But as we keep working on it, um, it will it will make a difference. So hang in there, trust the process, and all that that kind of stuff. Um, we're then going to change the size of the title um, and the font face. So we're going to make it bold. Um, and I'm using relative sizes here. And the, I'm able to do that because we use theme minimal as our starting point. Um, and theme minimal has a base text size of 11. Um, and I think and actually probably just the default theme would have a base text size of 11 as well. Um, and by using a relative size, um, it means that if we were to change the base text size of our plot, everything would scale accordingly. Um, this will come um, to be more relevant when we talk about packaging up our theme as a reusable function. Um, but for now, just trust me, if you use a relative size, you will save yourself a lot of headache going forwards. Um, and sometimes you do want to change the size of your plot if you're exporting it to a very small area or exporting it to a very big area, and you want to change the, the font size accordingly. But for now, let's use relative sizes so that everything scales nicely. Um, and they're going to change the fonts in my title um, and in my text. So the default font I'm going to use throughout is Cabin, um, which I think is a Google font. Uh, these are both Google fonts, actually. Cabin and then um, Enriqueta for the title font. Um, and again, it just kind of ties everything nicely so that it's obvious that there is something that is different um, from, from the rest of it in the title. Um, thanks, Louise. I'm glad, glad this is uh, relevant to the stuff that you're working on. That's great to hear. Um, so we've got um, a title font and we've got a text font. Uh, and we're already seeing much better text hierarchy than what we had in our initial plot. Let's see what else we can do. We can move away from the default fonts, and we need to do that in the rest of it as well. So we want to change our axis text. Um, for some reason, oh yes. So because the minimal has an axis, te axis text color built into it, we need to change that again. Uh, so it doesn't just take the basic, basic text color and apply it to the axes because it has its own axis text. So we need to change the axis text color um, and again, insist on it using the, the light color palette that we had here. Um, and then the strip text, I'm going to make that the same font as the title because it's kind of the title for that faceted group of data. Um, and again, using but using the light text this time around so it doesn't stand out quite as much and uh, making it bold and using relative text size so it's a little bit bigger. And um, again, so there we go. We've manipulated a bunch of things to do with the text. Um, and choosing fonts is tricky. So just as choosing colors is tricky, choosing fonts is tricky. And part of the reason why these things are tricky is because there's no way that I can tell you exactly which ones you need to use um, because there are no hard and fast rules. But there are some tips that we can follow. Again, you might have some brand guidelines. So there are standard NHS fonts that are used and um, which you might want to be using. If you're working somewhere else and you're just here for the workshop, great. You might also have your own fonts that your organization uses um, and that's fine. Um, you want to, however, bear a few things in mind that those fonts might work really well in branding documents, but they might not be great for data viz. And part of the reason why fonts sometimes don't work for data viz is that they're either too wide. So if you think of something like Poppins, which is a, a really popular font at the moment, it's got very round um, letters and each letter takes up a lot of space. And so if you're using that in a data viz, you have to kind of scan quite a long way to get the information that you need. And um, equally, you might have a font that's too narrow. So if you're using a, like a condensed font, again, can look quite stylish in text, but in the data viz, it might just mean that everything's a bit cramped uh, and it's hard to see. So there are various guidelines that you can use. Um, and the data wrapper blog post on, um, on picking fonts is really good for that. <coughs> um, my top tip, if you are using uh, if you're looking at a website and you think, oh, I really like that font combination, um, you can use the inspector tool. So let me just demo this on these slides because they're all HTML. What you do is you select and then you right click um, to inspect. And this will open up the, uh, the console down here. Hopefully you can all see this as well. If I could get a thumbs up from somebody, that would be good. Um, and rather than scrolling through until you find where it says font, great, thanks for the thumbs up. Um, you can just type in font up here and then this will tell you that my slides use NOAA as their basic font um, and if you wanted to look at what the title was you can see that there's no point reinventing the wheel <laughs> if you'd like a title font I've reused the same one 
um, again. So this is quite useful if you are looking at a website, you think that combination of fonts is really, really good. Um, then, then feel free to use that. Yes, and, and you can use this inspector tool to get the, the colors that people are using. Um, absolutely as well. It's, yeah, it's very, very, very good. Obviously, if you're going to completely rip off someone else's website design, um, that's not a good idea. Don't do that. Uh, you should at least acknowledge where you've got your ideas from. But if you just spot a font and you think, oh, that's really nice, um, then that's the way to figure out uh, what it is. Um, I really recommend Oliver Schundelfer's resources. Um, he's got a good article on the font matrix on how to choose fonts that pair well with each other. Um, so have a look at that um, if you're wanting to get creative with your fonts. And I think he, in my mind, his resources have a really good balance of um, wanting you to show creativity and personality, but also retain functionality in the way uh, that you, you pick your fonts. <laughs> Excuse me, this cough is coming back again. Um, in the way that you pick your fonts. So, uh, he has a newsletter in which he suggests fonts um, every week, uh, which is quite useful for, for keeping track of different font options and thus stuff that you hadn't really thought about um, and where you should use different fonts, whether they're title fonts or body text fonts and um, etc. So have a look again um, at his resources there. And getting custom fonts to work in R can be really, really frustrating, but the world has, has moved so much in the last few years and it's now so much easier than it used to be. Um, here is the current received wisdom on how to do it. So you want to install your fonts locally. Um, so you go to say Google fonts and you download the font family and then you install. If you're on Windows, you need to make sure that you right click and install for all users uh, so that RStudio can see it. Um, then I tend to restart RStudio uh, once I've installed my fonts and I have the system fonts package um, installed. So install system fonts and it will install RAG and text shaping as well. Um, and in the background of RStudio, you need to set your graphics device to AGG. Um, so that's what it looks like. If you go into your RStudio options um, and then click on graphics, and then you have a little drop down there um, that you can use to so select the right thing there and then um, cross your fingers and everything should, should work. Um, it doesn't always, um, and so um, one of the things that I discovered um, was that you need to set your um, dev to RAG PNG at the start of your knitter files or your markdown files or your quarter files, whatever it is that you're using to create that. Otherwise, you get plots that work really well in the viewer and that export fine with GGSave, but that don't render with your fonts inside documents. And that, is, that has caused a lot of frustration. So this hopefully is a shortcut so that you don't spend days trying to figure out why that's not working because I've already done that for you. Um, those days were, were frustrating days, but thankfully um, using this has got around that problem. You will still, however, have moments in your life where you just want to throw your computer out because the fonts are not working. Um, and for those moments, I highly recommend um, Jun Cho's uh, blog post on setting and debugging some fonts in R. Um, he has some really good tips on uh, fun things that you can do with fonts that I didn't know about, like aligning the numbers or um, creating your own custom symbols and all that kind of stuff. So have a look um, at what is probably the most comprehensive blog post on uh, using fonts in R uh, that I've found. So we've, we've thought about text um, and fonts. We've got a set of colors uh, for our plot and for our text, and we've got some rules about where we're going to use them, whether it's the title, where it's the body text, Etc. And so we're really on our way to creating a database design system, which is a simple set of rules that you can follow so that your plots effortlessly look on brand every time you get to create a new plot. Um, now, because we're using R, we know that we can also automate um, some of this. So it's worth having a think about. Again, we've already thought about accessibility. So that means that if you reuse this, you've already done that work. And meaningful colors within your own context to reuse across your plot. It also gives you a nice visual identity so that wherever your plots get published, it's tied back to your research group or to your department, which is great. Um, and as I said, we can implement that as an R package. Now we don't have time to go into more of this today, but if you want to find out more, I'm giving a talk about that next week um, about creating a, a database design system um, and the, the value that that brings to, to your work as well. So anyway, Let's go back to our plot. We've created a bit of text hierarchy. We've given it a different title font and a different body font. Um, and now I think we need to give everything a little bit of space to breathe. It's a little bit squished. 
So to do that, uh, we can change the line height. So I've changed the line height in the title to 1.3 and added a bit of margin around the title itself. Um, and I've also added a bit of margin um, around the strip text so that it's just much clearer um, that this label applies to what's underneath it and not what's above it. So if you create a bit of space above things, um, then that helps. When you're talking about margins, um, it's worth trying to you know close your eyes a little bit and see do you still do, do you naturally group the things in the way that you want them to be grouped um, and if you do that's great and if you don't then try and think about what you can do where you can introduce a bit of space um, so that things do get grouped uh, where they need to be we're going to get rid of the y-axis title because it just said dose and that's not that useful to be repeating that uh, when we've already got the word doses in the title and it's quite clear from the way that we've written our um, access text that we're talking about doses there. So we can get rid of that again, just removing text that we don't need. Um, and then we're going to just make sure that the title still fits. So you might have noticed um, that the title just about fits here um, and then it doesn't fit here if I make the text uh, much bigger, which is a bit of a pain uh, and something that we have to wrestle with every now and then. Although I recently discovered um, that you can use a uh, GG text, geom text box. Um, where was I going? Wait a minute. So yeah, the, the title here doesn't fit because it's all just one line. Um, and wait a minute, was there a break? No, there is a break. That's a line break. So I have a line break here, um, which means that the title goes back but it doesn't fit on the page. And I used to spend so much time trying to figure out, okay, where do I need to put that line break so that it's gonna work, so the title doesn't go off the edge of the plot. Um, and if you get rid of the line break entirely, as I have done here, then the title just goes off the edge of the plot, even in the smaller text size. So how do we how do we get around that? And um, this is one of the other reasons why I love ggtext. Uh, I use it in most of the visualizations that I create. The ggtext has um, this element text box simple, which you can use um, inside your theme. Um, and what it does is it puts your title inside a box. Um, and then the box resizes if you resize your, your plot. Um, and so it makes it all fit. So let's just have a look at what that does. Yeah. So here, the, the title is going all the way across. I haven't added a line break in the title. But because I put it inside element text box simple, it has returned at the right point. Um, and so we end up with a title that no longer goes off the edge of the plot, uh, but which sits nicely within that. And um, there's a few things that, it, you know, it doesn't always work because if you've got several lines for the subtitle and several lines for the title, you can have the boxes that end up overlapping with each other. So you have to be a little bit careful um, with how you use it. But um, if you know that you've got a long title and you can't be bothered figuring out where the line breaks need to go, and to be fair, you probably should automate it anyway. Um, then using element textbook simple is is a friendly way to do it and um, it will save you quite a lot of work so element textbook simple and then because we're using ggtext and element textbook simple or element markdown we can use bits of html and css um, inside our title so um no i'm not um telling you that you need to know everything about html and css but um, i'm going to give you some little bits and pieces that you can use uh, which are quite useful so if we see here the text that I've written, this is the code, and this is how it renders. You can change the uh, the color of your text and also the size of your text inside little span tags. So you've got span here and the end of the span here and same here um, and the end there. And then when it renders, you get green text and you get really big green text. Um, and we can use this in uh, just a normal markdown document or a quarter document, um, but we can also use it inside our titles if we're using um, ggtext and its components as well. So let's let's do a little bit of that. Um, we, we've got our named color palette um, that we've got, vitamin C palette, in which we know we have an orange juice color, and we've also got a vitamin C color. And so what we can do is say inside the span, okay, we're gonna change the color to the orange juice color, where it says the word orange juice, and then, whoops, we close this one there. And then we're also gonna change the color to vitamin C for the word vitamin C, and close this one here. And then that's what it does to the text. So we've got orange juice written in the orange juice color, and vitamin C written in the vitamin C color. 
And so that allows us to very quickly, when we're looking at the plot, figure out what um, what's what. Um, you don't need the legend. You've already indicated it there. Um, and so you can just allow readers to very quickly orient themselves to what's going on um, inside the plot. But that yellow was bugging me in preparation for this because I know that that yellow doesn't actually work. Um, because when you look at the color contrast checker, it fails. Uh, so the top tip for getting around that is to uh, manipulate your uh, light color so that it's a darker shade of itself. Um, and it will still still be tied in with it. You'll still get the impression um, that it's a similar color. It will still be clear enough that it's associated with that, but it will also be readable. So if you're using a light color and you want to use it in text, then try to pick a darker version of it for the text itself. <coughs> so again, add it into the color contrast checker and <coughs> manipulated it. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. And there we go. Uh, picked a different colour that is a slightly murkier version of that yellow. It's not as clean as I'd like it to be, but it'll do for the purposes of this demo that you can see, okay, we're using colour to indicate things. By the time you hit vitamin C, you know that's what it is. Um, and it makes it readable, which is always a bonus. Excuse me while I grab a quick... We're back. Um, we've got that. And you can see for yourselves um, that adding a bit of text hierarchy and color um, really does help the, the main message of the plot stand out. It's no longer a slightly overwhelming set of sentences and legends and axis text and everything. You've, you've pared it down to what you actually need and you've made it easier for the, the readers to navigate it as well. So quick quiz time. Um, <coughs> the galaxy may need a legend, but do you need a legend on your plot? Um, a lot of this is about getting rid of the information that we don't need. So I'm going to show you some plots um, and type in the chat whether you think it needs a legend or not. So here's our first one, which is from a Power BI tutorial that I found online. Do we need the legend? <coughs> Excuse me. No, 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 great. Everybody's saying, no, 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 okay, you don't need a legend. You don't need a legend because it doesn't add anything. You've already got the information on the axis and the colors are purely decorative. The colors are not giving you anything that is useful information other than the text that you've already got here. So great, we do not need a legend for this one. Do we need a legend here? <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. Exactly. We have no, no idea what's going on. If we don't have a legend here, okay, we can't uh, figure it out. But actually, the nice thing here is that the legend is in the right order. So it's it's done in the order that the data appears in the plot, um, which means that you're not jumping around trying to figure out what's what because it's placed nicely. So if you're going to add a legend, try and think about how you could do that as well. Do we need a legend? <laughs> Seeing Zoe's face on this one, yeah, it's good. <laughs> Yes, 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 we need a legend in this because we have no idea what's going on. Um, we actually might want to talk about using small multiples instead of using a plot like this because these plots get really, really messy. Um, and I'm actually building one for a conference talk I'm giving next week in a different conference um, about how the, the bakers did in the different seasons of the Bake Off and how they went through the technicals. Not that I'm at all obsessed with the, the Bake Off. Um, but yeah, small multiples are generally a, a better way to go with these kind of things. Um, do we need a legend here? No, no, no. Yeah, great. We don't really need a legend here. I would probably have a think about the fact that you have to turn your head upside down to read some of the, the text that's there. Um, John Text Path actually fixes that for you. We'll come to that one in a minute. Um, but yeah, we don't really need the legend um, for this one. The annotations are already there, and actually it's much much easier to see them because otherwise it's quite hard to compare which which blue corresponds to the right the right blue there. Um, what about here? Yeah, no, we probably don't. Um, the interesting thing here, though, is that the legend is adding extra information because it's, it seems to be a different, you know, we've got percentages on the, the donut plot and then we've got actual values 
um, in the other one. So I would maybe consider adding a table or something instead if you want to show more information. Um, but yeah, you're right, the, the donut in and of itself doesn't mean the legend. Um, and this is one that I made um, a while ago, that compromise that we need the legend. Yeah, yeah, we do. So I think the legend does add something, but I'd probably rethink it. If I was to make this again, um, I would maybe place my legend points so that they meet the, the cardinal points um, that, it, that it's talking about in terms of north, east, west, and south. Um, yeah, so have a think about your own plots. Do, do you actually need a legend? Um, I'm going to hand over to you again at this point um, to see um, your plots. Think critically about your text. How much text do you actually need? and then think about how you can manipulate the text to add that text hierarchy that we've been talking about. Um, system fonts is quite useful for having a look at what fonts are already installed on your computer, um, in that if you type in that command system fonts, um, double column system fonts view, um, then it will um, bring up, I'll just post that into the chat actually, um, it will bring up a data frame which shows you which fonts you have installed, uh, which also shows you what Oh, has called it when it's found your font um, so that you don't have to um, try and guess at whether there's a space or a hyphen or whatever it is in the font name when you're trying to reuse that. So have a look at what fonts you've got and pick two, you know, at random for the purpose of the exercise and getting it working. Uh, but if you want to pick ones that you really like, then, then go for that as well. If you want to install a new font, have a go at doing that as well. Uh, but be aware that you might have to restart, restart our studio and for our studio to, to see it. Um, and then try, remember how we created those text color variants there? So we picked a, a key color from the photo and went darker. Um, and then we also went lighter again to create some light text variants as well. Um, and uh, yeah, see how you get on. I've given you quite a menu of things to, to play with when it comes to text hierarchy. So that's why you've got 10 minutes. Um, so again, I'll hang around um, and grab a drink. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and I'll do my best to help. So let's kick the timer off um, and I'll see you all in 10 minutes with hopefully some more text hierarchy in your plots.
Okay. That's you at the end of another 10 minutes. Um, thank you to Francesca for pointing out that I had the, probably put the typo in the, the system fonts command. So um, hopefully that, that got you sorted. Um, I hope that that worked for you. If anyone got stuck with anything, um, do, do give me a shout. Um, but hopefully you're now well on track to creating plots that have a good amount of text hierarchy in them. Uh, where you can really quickly see um, what the most important thing is and importantly just guide your readers as to what the most important thing is that they should be focusing on to, to make sense of the plot itself. So from here, there's a bunch of things that we can do. Um, we're going to be adding more in-plot annotations in, in a minute, but I thought um, I would just talk quickly about packaging things up because at this point you've put a bit of work into a set of colours that you like and a set of fonts that you like and how you want to use them in the theme function of your plot. Um, now, what you don't want to do is uh, to create uh, your code and then copy paste it everywhere. Okay, so we want to turn that theme function um, into a bespoke theme function. And then once you've done that, you can quite easily add it into a package. And um, package development is one of these things that um, some people think is just for the really hardcore R people. Um, it's not, it's not actually that difficult. Um, if you know how to write a function, then you really know how to write a package. Um, you just have a few guides that you can follow uh, to, to get you there. Um, and any function or object that you can create uh, can be added into a package. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in creating packages, I highly recommend using the this, use this package um, to, to guide you with that. It will help you set it up in a way that makes sense um, with how the, the Tidyverse convention has evolved um, and also does useful things in terms of GitHub and um, if you want to store it up there, if you want to make it a private package with an authorization key, it guides you into how to do that and all that stuff. So um, all that to say, package development is, is not as scary as you think it is um, and it's well worth investing in if you're going to be reusing stuff a lot. Um, there's a great blog post by um, Shannon Pileggi on how to write your first R package in an hour. Um, that I've linked again in these slides, and I've put the link to that in the talk page on my website, um, which you can have a look at. Again, it just demystifies the whole thing, um, and that's that's what I used to create uh, Monochroma back in the day. So uh, have a look at that if you want to be reusing your code. Um, so as I said, anything that you create can be added back into a packet, uh, into a package. So I do that for my colors because I can never remember what they are. Um, and then that gives me the hex codes for them. And also, um, yeah, just I can print them out in monochroma quite easily to have a, a quick look at what they are. So our current status is that we've got the plot and then we've got theme mineral. And then we've got 20 plus lines of code after that modifying our theme. Um, to add the text hierarchy, change the alignments, make it more clear what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. What we want is to be able to create a basic ggplot and then do plus theme guinea pigs, say, because that's what we've been working on, um, with one line of code that we can then reuse uh, wherever we want to. So I'm just going to show you how we do that um, because we're going to use that uh, next. So here is the, the full code that we've got. Um, we've got a theme minimal. And then we are doing plus theme, et cetera, et cetera. So all we need to do is wrap that inside theme guinea pigs and then define a function with our little curly brackets there and there as well. Um, and the important thing to remember when you're creating a function um, is that the function needs to not be able to see, it needs to be able to see to work without seeing anything that's outside of itself. Um, so when you're creating a function, if you're pulling things in like a base text size, then set it as an argument. And same thing if you're creating, a, if you're going to be using a color palette inside the function, then you need to feed it into the function um, at the in, as one of the arguments as well. So try to remember that when you're creating functions, you can cheat a little bit with R, but it's not a good idea um, because you can then end up using stuff inside your function that's completely different to what you think it is. So uh, if you're creating a function, think of it as a self-contained element um, that it can't really see anything outside of itself. Um, and that should keep you right. So that's all I've done. I've copy pasted all the code that we've written here um, to create our theme um, and popped it inside um, a, a function definition. Um, so then we have our theme guinea pigs and we can change the base text size if we want to. 
uh, which is useful, as I said, if you're exporting your plot to a really small file or to a really big file, you want to be able to scale the text accordingly. And because we used relative text sizes um, inside it, then the text sizes will all scale accordingly as well. Um, so that's the advantage of, of having done that. So just to show that it works, um, here we have a different plot uh, using the, the Palmer Penguins data set again, um, just a scatter plot. Uh, we've got some labels, <laughs> we've got a legend, and then if we just add the guinea pigs, you can see that it has pulled in the title font that we used, the body font that we used, the different colours that we used for the text, um, and it's got rid of an axis title and rid of the legend as well. So again, you might want to manipulate stuff further, um, but you can you can do that. You can add things back into the theme. Uh, you can remove more things if you need to remove them. Um, but I hope you can see the advantage of just having one line of code here to do all of that styling rather than having 20 lines of code um, that are kicking around your code base all over the place. And if you decide, actually, don't like that font, you've got to change it in all those different places. Whereas if you define that function somewhere, whether that's inside a package or whether you have a file that you run that creates that function for you, um, then at least you, you've only got to change it in one place if you decide that you want to, to change it. Um, okay, so that was text hierarchy and packaging up. Um, and my third tip for creating our graphs is to try and reduce unnecessary eye movement. Um, it's unnecessary eye movement. It's also kind of cognitive load, getting people to have to focus on lots of different things and remember lots of different things in different places. So we'll have a look at some uh, tips and tricks that we can use to do that. So we've made it easy to see what's what, and now we're going to make it even easier to compare values across the two. We've got a themed plot here. And um, the first thing I'm going to do, if you can see, I, what I've done is I've basically reduced the margins around the bars uh, so that the axis text is closer to the start of the bar. Just, you know, getting rid of one, one bit of jump that we don't have to do. Um, I'm then going to move the strip text so that it starts at the start of the bar. Again, just to stop you jumping from the middle of the plot back to the start, back to along the bar again. If all the information that you need is neatly packaged at the edge here, makes it a little bit easier to process. Um, and then we're going to add in some text boxes, and this is where the fun starts. So we're going to use 2 Text Geom text box. Um, I really like this uh, this function because you can do quite a lot more styling with it with it than what you can do with um, just Geom text uh, or Geom label um, inside that because it uses Markdown. Uh, it understands Markdown syntax inside the the label that you are creating. So let's first add a label and then and then we'll start styling it a little bit. So if you remember when we created our basic plot. And inside the initial ggplot call, we fed it the what the x-axis was, what the y-axis was, and what the colors were. So it already knows that. Uh, so when we're creating our text box, we don't need to reiterate that. All we need to give it is the label that we want to use, which in our case is the mean length of the teeth of our guinea pigs, because that's the weird thing that we're looking at today. So we've got the guinea pigs uh, mean length of teeth inside a box. And because it already knows what color it is, it's already filling in the background of the box um, with the color that is associated with either orange juice or vitamin C, because we've got that set up already in the initial ggplot call. Now, this probably isn't where we want our text boxes to sit, um, but having the box visible allows you to see what it's doing. What it's doing is it's popping a box there so that the middle of the box corresponds to the end of the bar. So it's doing that for all of them, and then it has just left aligned the text inside um, the box. So we're going to change all of that because that doesn't look great. Um, and we're going to make sure that the boxes are aligned where we want them to. So let's do that just now. Um, we can change the size of the text inside the box, make it a little bit bigger. And we can align it to the right using h align equals 1. And we can also justify the text to the right using h just equals 1. Um, I can never remember which one is which, so I created an alignment cheat sheet. Oh, looks like that post doesn't actually... Wrong link. Anyway, um, I will post the link to the alignment cheat sheet later um, to try and remember, is it H align or it's just that moves the text and which direction does it move it in and all that kind of stuff. But basically, using Geom text box, you can manipulate both of those. So you can move the text box to one bit and the text inside it to one side or the other of the box which is really handy if you want to try and do what we're going to do next, 
which is to flip the alignment based on how long the bar is and whether you have space inside the bar to fit the text. But first, let's just finish signing this. So we're going to get rid of the fill inside the box um, because we'd used transparency and that was kind of messing things up. And we're going to set the box color to NA because that gets rid of the contour of the box because we don't, we don't really need the contour of the box there um, either. So now we've got just some bars with some text inside the end of them. And we're well on our way towards something that looks uh, sensible. But let's make sure it all lines up. So part of the visual clutter that you can have in your, in your plots is having lots of different fonts uh, where you don't need them. So let's make sure that the font um, is the same as the, the rest of the fonts in our, in our plot. And you have to re-specify that because it's not one of the theme elements. It doesn't read in the, the theme font that you had popped in. Um, so you need to make sure that you specify the font again. You can change the color of the text inside there, and we're going to make it bold as well, just so that it stands out um, nicely. Now, we're probably getting into slightly troubled waters when it comes to the color contrasts on these, but definitely uh, getting into the problems when it comes to the, the lighter bar. So we need a solution for, for dealing with that. Um, and what we're going to do for that is um, quite a fun party trick, which is to make the box of your the text box line up differently depending on uh, which um, which side of the bar. Uh, you want it to be. So the text inside the box lines up differently and the box itself lines up differently. Um, and this is useful in our case, not just because of the color contrast issue, but it's really useful if you're creating a set of plots and you might have some subsets of your data where the bar is going to be really short because there are not that many people that fall into that group or not, many, or not that many observations uh, within that. So you might have a really short bar, but also some really long bars. So if you put the text inside the bar, um, it saves you space so your bar can stretch all the way out. But sometimes there's not enough space inside your bar if you've got some really short ones. So if you decide, OK, if the mean length is smaller than 15, then we're going to align on the other side than if it's greater than 15. And do the same thing with the text, then you end up with this. So you've got, I've made the text black again so that we can see it, because otherwise the white text on the white background of the plot was not visible. So um, what we're doing here is a conditional alignment based on the length of the bar. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody, um, what we've done. Um, again, just a really neat trick um, that can save you quite a lot of time um, and also means that everything lines up where you want it to. Uh, now for the next party trick, we're going to change the color of it. So we're going to say when the mean length is greater than um, 15, so when we have a long bar, the text is inside the bar and we're going to make the text white. But if the text is outside the bar, then we're going to make it the text that corresponds to the supplement, so the orange juice color or the vitamin C color. So let's have a look and see what happens. Oh, uh, that's not quite what we expected. So what has happened here? Um, is that ggplot has said, oh, you've created a new set of colors here um, that I was not aware of. I'm going to go creative and pick from the default um, ggplot colors because it doesn't know, you know, it, we've, we've given it a value, but um, it's, it's struggling to interpret it. What we need to do is say scale color identity, um, and then it will read in the colors that we're giving. So rather than reading this in as just a random string that corresponds to a factor that needs a random color, it's reading it in as the hex code for white. And same here, rather than reading this in as a random string, it's reading it in as the hex code that corresponds to that color because we're saying scale color identity. So let's give that a bash. And there we go, we've got it sorted. So we've got our colors that work out um, with the, the colors that correspond to the objects that we're depicting um, and that are conditional based on whether they're inside the bar or outside of the bar. Um, so again, color contrast on this one isn't perfect um, and you would want to have a think about that, but um, yeah, it does the job for, for the purposes of the demonstration here um, and hopefully gives you another, another thing to try out in your plots to make them work well. Um, we can we might as well add a bit of text hierarchy to our labels. You know, they're a bit boring there. They've just got one value in them. And what what is that value again? Is it the length of the tooth or is it, you know, how old the guinea pigs were or whatever? Um, we can re-specify that um, inside there. And so we can create a label by pasting a few things together. Some people really like glue. Glue is fine. I like paste because it's not an extra dependency. Um, so we're going to use paste and then we're going to say 
that inside a little span tag that starts here and ends here, we want the font size to be 12 points and we're going to specify what the dose was. And then outside of that span, we're just going to put the mean length and then uh, millimeters, which is the unit that we're using to measure the guinea pig's teeth. Um, and that's what that does. So you've got a nice little bit of smaller text, which is just a reminder of the dose. Is it necessary? Not strictly so, but it avoids you having to jump backwards and forwards um, across your plot. Um, and then you still keep the main thing, the main thing by having the value that you're interested in being bigger than the text that's just a, a nice little reminder of what it is that you're, you're looking at. Um, and the units are in there as well. Um, when I tested this out with different subsets, I realized that I then needed to make sure that I rounded the, the lengths. Otherwise, you ended up with some very, very, very long labels, um, which you don't really need if you have a number that doesn't, uh, doesn't divide nicely when you create the mean. So we rounded that. Um, and we've got a plot. And now at this point, you're thinking, but that's great. Why, why on earth would I spend the time doing this? Um, I could just do it in PowerPoint or MS Paint or, you know, Figma, probably, probably Figma would be a nice tool. So why, why on earth would you bother doing this? Um, partly because it, it saves you that moment where you've spent all your time getting your graph to look really, really good. You've annotated it, you've done your text hierarchy, you've made sure that the elements are all fitting in exactly where you need them to. And then that super keen colleague who had changed your string to fact earlier comes back and he says, you know what, you know, remember that bit of data that we thought we found it, I found it and I've added it back in and we can include it back into the, the plot. And, you know, inside you're thinking, yay for science, but for me, like, no, I spent all this time getting all these plots to look amazing, got my annotations just where I need them. And I'm going to have to redo all of that again from scratch. No. So in setting up your plots in this way, it avoids that moment. Um, and it also means that you can start building your plots while you're still working on your research project, because you can start to, you know, rather than waiting till the end to see everything, you can start setting up some foundations, which will then speed up the process when you get that final, okay, we've got all the data, we've done the analysis, we're ready to go. And um, so, yeah, it just, it sets things up well for you um, and it avoids um, manual errors, which happen. You know, if you're copy pasting values from one thing to another, um, then it's very likely that some mistakes will creep in there. So try and think about this as saving you time, saving you some sanity. And yes, you might lose a bit of sanity in the process of setting it up in the first place. But once you've figured it out, um, it will, it is a massive time saver. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I've done some annotations using Figma for a project that was definitely a one-off. But otherwise, this is basically what I do all the time um, because it's, yeah. Once you know how to do it, it, it is really easy. And hopefully, now that you've come to this workshop, you do feel like you know how to do it, um, which is great. And it means that then you can, as I said, feed it different subsets of your data and it will do the right thing and it will line things up nicely. Um, and it means that your plots work. This is really useful as well if you're creating parameterized reports. So if you're, say, reporting on all the different trusts within an area, um, you can create the same plots and have them do this kind of stuff for you so that they all look nice and stylized without you having to do the, the extra effort of adding those annotations in by hand. So hopefully I convinced you that this is worth, uh, <laughs> worth the effort. Um, but one thing was bugging me when I was looking at this gift that I made is, oh, that title is just, why is it sitting there? It's not sitting in the right place. So let's just fix that alignment because it was annoying me. Um, and it allows me to show you an extra tri uh, trick, which is quite useful, which is this little line here, uh, plot title position equals plot. Um, it aligns it with the whole plot rather than just aligning it with the, the kind of panel inside the plot. Um, so again, useful tip. Um, to to make sure that you're not having to jump different alignments all over the place. If if things are roughly, as long as something is aligned with something else, uh, you know you're okay. It's when you have all sorts of things all over the place that it gets it starts to feel cluttered, and then that detracts from from what you're trying to show. And um, so we'll fix that. We'll add a bit of breathing space around the plot using the plot margin here. It's much easier to see on the dark background. Um, and again, I've just repeated the, the base size that we had. So um, if you were creating that inside your function, you could probably say rep uh, base text size four. So we're repeating 15 four times, and that gives us a margin of 15 points around uh, the, the whole edge of it. Um, and there we go. We've reduced unnecessary eye movement, and you can see for yourself the comparison between 
our starting plot, which we already thought we'd pick the right colors and stylize and add some text hierarchy to. And the, the finishing point um, at this point of the workshop, which is to have some text boxes inside the bars, which just make that comparison easier. We've moved the strip text um, and we've added a bit of margin around the top and the bottom of the plot as well. So it doesn't feel quite so cramped um, against its background. Um, and yeah, and it's easier than you think, but it makes a big difference. And you also end up being a bit of a superhero in your team because you can do this kind of stuff uh, much, much quicker. And the poor person that spent time doing it manually and had to redo it again uh, will, will thank you um, the next time. So again, I'm gonna hand over to you. Uh, we've got plenty of time in this workshop this morning, so I'm keen for you to, to have a go at this um, and see what you can do. So try to add a text box or even several um, inside your plot, see how you get on. Um, add a bit of styling with some markdown um, inside of that if you can, if you remember how we did that with those little span tags. Um, and then if you have time, see what happens if you try and create the plot with a subset of your data and if there's anything else that you need to think about in terms of how you display rounded numbers or where it falls or if anything ends up breaking. Um, it's worth checking that. So again, I'll give you 10 minutes to have a look at this. Um, please do send me any screenshots of stuff that you're working on. Um, I'd be more than happy to, to chat about them um, as well. So see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, that's the end of another 10 minutes. Hopefully, again, you haven't got stuck. Um, I found the blog post that I tried to refer to earlier, um, which Zoe very helpfully put a link to as well, because I think we reposted it on the NHSR website as well, didn't we? Um, but yeah, here it is um, as well on mine. If you wanted to have a look at those alignments again and figure out where they, why the boxes are lining up where they are. And I find myself quite regularly getting rid of the box contour and then putting the box contour back on when I'm trying to figure out why, where is that box lining up and why is this not working the way that I think it should. So um, that's totally fine. You know, you're basically in debugging mode, but uh, in, in plots um, when, you know, you know when you would put like print everywhere in your code to try and figure out what stage it's got to and what it's reading in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, same thing for plots, just get it to give you more than you need it to um, for, for a while. And then that'll help you figure out where things might have got stuck. Um, okay, so um, if there's no questions in the chat that I can see, uh, we'll just move on to, to the last bit of the, the workshop. We might finish a bit early, but that's, that's fine. That leaves us time for some questions. Uh, but hopefully this has given you plenty to, to go and play with uh, once we're done. So the last thing we're going to look at is highlighting important patterns. We've used color purposefully, we've added text hierarchy, we reduced unnecessary eye movements. And so now highlighting important patterns in the data is a great way to help people engage uh, with what's going on. Um, and we're going to figure out how those penguins got on anyway, because we started off with a, an episode of The Great Penguin Bake Off. So now we need to figure out what, what happened. And um, we're going to use that data to illustrate means and trends and key data points and how we can create nice text boxes with arrows, how we create um, text that goes along a path, um, and how we can use the means to put text boxes in exactly the places where we want them to be. Um, so at this point in the workshop, you have everything that you need to know how to get from this basic plot to this one. Okay, these are the same tips and tricks that we've applied. We've picked some colors that are meaningful. We've used transparency. We've added some text, uh, text color. Um, We've uh, added some different colors for the axis text, for the subtitle text, for the title, um, and we've got everything in such a way that it's much less overwhelming to look at than the original plot, even though it contains exactly the same information. Um, so you know how to get from plot A to, to plot B by this point in the workshop. Um, so what we're going to look at now is how we build on that. So we've got a themed penguins plot, um, and we're going to think about adding some text boxes in instead of a legend. In order to do that, we're going to have to create some data um, for our text boxes. So we're going back to the Palmer Penguins data set, uh, which if you haven't played around with yet, is a, a really brilliant data set um, because it, you know, it's about penguins and it's cute, but it also has some really fun features in it uh, that you can explore in your, your plots. Um, and it also, um, yeah, it just you can explore it in lots of different ways and create lots of different plots from it. So it's my go-to when I'm trying to, to demonstrate something. But we're going to create a species um, for each a species summary for each species of the, the penguins that we have. And so we're going to take the Palmer Penguins data set and we're going to group it by species. And then once we've grouped it, we're going to create some summaries. So we're going to summarize the uh, mean bill depth and the mean bill length. Um, and once we've got that, we've got ourselves a nice little table, which basically just has the species and then the, the means that we've created here. Um, and then we're going to add an extra column of commentary. Um, and that commentary is going to form the content of our text boxes. So we're going to say when the species is a deli, we're going to add the commentary that the Adeli penguins tried varying the amount of banana in their mix. Turns out even a hint of green banana is detrimental to yumminess. Great, that's, that's the summary that we're taking away from the Penguin Big Off. And if the species is Gen 2, then we're going to say that the overripe bananas are typically, typically um, had shorter baking times. And then true, remember true from case when? So true is the catch-all for stuff that didn't meet the, the criteria above it. Um, so we've got the Adeli, the uh, Gen 2, and then it's the chin strap, then it will be ca captured in the true. And we're going to say ripe bananas and slightly not cooking times for them. So we've got ourselves a little table that's got all that information in it. Um, and this is what it looks like. So we've got a row for each species, the means that we've just calculated, and then the commentary that we've just added in. Um, and we can now use that data to create text boxes that we can sit on top of the data to help people orient themselves again when they're reading it. 
So this is what that looks like. Again, I'm using ggtext and geomtextbox, um, this beloved function that I use for most of my visualizations. Um, and we'd already fed some data into the themed penguins plot, but here we're feeding it different data because we just want the summary data that we've just created. So you can do that. You can create a GT plot that has a set of data at the start of it and then reads in a different data set uh, for the rest of it. And because there's quite a lot of overlap in how the data is set up and deliberately so, um, it will read in the, the information that we need and it will place it at the right point. So we're reading in the data that we've just created and then we're going to create our labels. Um, again, we're going to say, you know, the, put, put the word team and then put in the species. And the double asterisk here just makes that text bold. So we're going to say that text is bold. And because in our main ggplot call, we'd already specified that the color should be tied to the species, um, it's already pulling in the right color, as you can see, for the species uh, the titles of the text boxes in here. But we don't want the whole text box to be yellow or green or brown. So we're going to override that again using a bit of markdown um, to say inside the span. Uh, we're going to use the light text color and we're going to include the commentary, which was the bit of text that we added about each of the species and how they had got on um, in the, the Bake Off. Hopefully everyone's following me so far in terms of how we've created these labels. And um, so inside the bold bit, we've got team and then the species, and then we've got the commentary and we've overridden the color so that we're using the light text color for that. So that it all ties in nicely uh, with the rest of what we're doing. So uh, once we've done that, we can start styling it again a little bit so we can change the font. And in this plot, I'm using DM Sans as my, um, my main font uh, for everything. And it's Poppins in the, the title up there. Um, and so we're changing the font inside the text boxes. We're changing the size of the text. Uh, we're setting a width for the boxes, uh, which we can do. We're making them slightly transparent so you can see the data that's behind them. I wouldn't recommend doing this kind of thing if you need each data point to stand out really clearly, but because we're just looking at filling some text boxes on top of some data and we can still see the overall trend, um, then I say we can get away with it um, in this time. And I'm also going to get rid of the box contour uh, by using box color equals NA. So we've gone from this to this, just with a bit of styling. Um, and again, it just ties it in nicely with the rest of the plot. Um, the other thing that you might want to do is uh, if you want to highlight the trends in the data rather than just highlight the means of those data, um, is to use GeomTextPath. Now, GeomTextPath is another one of my favorite uh, functions, uh, favorite packages at the moment. Um, it's really good fun because you can very easily um, create annotations that follow the line, uh, follow the curve of your data. So I'll just show you what that does. Um, all I'm doing here, again, is adding in just the label because it already knows what goes on the X and the Y axis because we've specified that at the start. Um, and we also already know the color because we've specified that at the start. So all we need to add at this point um, is the label. Um, and this is what we get. Now, not very clear here because of the combination of text um, and the color. So we could instead um, do a bit of changing uh, the transparency behind it so that we can see what's going on. All I've done there, this is a massive uh, hack, but I've added a rectangle um, over the top of the data. So this is a rectangle that goes from all the four corners uh, to the other four corners, well, from each corner to the other corner in the plot. So I'm sure there's a much better way of saying that. Covers the surface of the plot, there we go. Covers the area um, and it's white, uh, but it's, it's transparent. So you can see the labels a little bit better. Again, not brilliant, uh, but it does the job to, to demonstrate how this package works. You can format it and make it bold. You can change where the label sits on the line. Um, it's quite fun, just all the different things that you can do uh, to play around with that. And this is nothing new. So this is something from uh, Playfair, uh, from his original data visualizations that are housed in the special collections um, at Edinburgh Uni's library. So if you're ever in Edinburgh and you fancy nerding out on some database, I highly recommend heading to their um, special collections. Uh, you have to book it in advance and arrange it and stuff, but yeah, get, get in touch if you're interested in doing that, because I, I really enjoyed doing that with a client recently. Um, and we had a look at the stuff that was in there and just the way that he used database. Um, yeah, I think his background was, um, yeah, kind of there was architecture in there somewhere and maps. And so you can understand where, where it all came together, but we all concluded it seems like slightly more mature uh, an expression of data visualization than you would expect if this was really the, the first use of it. 
Um, but you know that's what he's credited for, and um, and it's great. And it was also fun to see him do some funky things with axes as well. Um, the axes were not consistent in some of the plots, um, and so it was fun to see. Okay, well he got away with that. Why did he do that? Why? How would we do that differently? Would we do the same thing again? Um, anyway, all this to say, he he did this kind of stuff of having. Uh, intuitive colors so we've got you know green is positive red is negative um, and also having labels that fall inside the data and labels that follow the lines so it's really i find it really nice that uh, the, the ggplot and associated packages are allowing us to reproduce some of the stuff that was done in the very early days of data viz um, and to do it much more effortlessly than he probably had to um you know by hand and figuring out where everything was going to go so um yeah, Geom Text Path is, is a fun thing to play around with. Um, as I said, it doesn't really work particularly well in this plot. Um, here's one that I had created in a previous session, which I think works a lot better, um, in that you can see quite easily that it, it does just follow the line of the graph. Um, really, really useful if you're doing this kind of thing. And again, it means that you don't have to have a legend because you've got the colors that are specified within the, the plot um, again. so. Worth exploring. And this is just a kind of whirlwind of all the possible things that you might want to do with text and your data. But hopefully you can you can pick one and say, yes, actually this one, this one is going to help. Um, and then next time you go to create a plot, you might think um, of using a different tool. So that's fine. We looked at how the, the overall penguins did within their species. We discovered that you should not bake banana loaves with green bananas. Um, but it's also worth having a look at how the individual penguins did. So who was the, the runner up um, and who was the winner and who, who had to leave the tent um, at the end of, uh, of this episode. So we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping first to tidy things up, because this time we're starting from the raw uh, penguins data set inside the Palmer Penguins package. Um, which is a little bit different. So we need to rename things uh, because they've got it as common depth and we want it as build depth um, and same here. So we're just going to change those using the rename function, which is nice and easy to do. Um, and then we're going to find our star baker, our runner up and the penguin with the lowest score, uh, which we're taking bill length to be the, the lowest, uh, the, the judge of, of yumminess, the, the yumminess rating. So <clears throat> we're going to find the, the maximum on the, the highest bill length, and then we're going to sort them and find the second one, which is going to give us our runner up, because we're sorting them in decreasing order. Um, and then we're going to find the penguin with the lowest score with the, the min. And that's just going to filter the, the raw penguin data set down to, to these guys. Now, once we've done that, uh, we can add a bit more stuff. So we're going to do a bit more housekeep housekeeping, which is to align the species in this data set with the species that are in the kind of summary data set. So in, in this data set, the raw data set, they have kind of long species names, whereas in the other one, it's just at that age and chin strap and gentoo. So we're going to just do a little bit of um, G subbing and with a bit of uh, regex again, but don't worry too much about that. Um, if you don't like playing around with that, that's fine. I find some kind of weird satisfaction of getting getting it right um, without having to to look things up because um, you feel you feel like you've won something. Um, anyway, bit of an epic win at times because it can take a while. But uh, all that I'm doing here is tidying up the species names so that we've got the same species names that we've got in our original data which means that then it will know how to map the colors onto them and we don't have to re-specify anything, which is definitely worth investing in. Now we're going to do a bit of text manipulation. The text manipulation in R um, I really enjoy, and I've actually written a package called Verbalizer, uh, which does some of that for us. Um, it allows you to create lists of things when you don't know how many elements are in the list. Um, and you can even be picky about whether you want an Oxford comma or not. Um, and the whole point of creating that was to um, do this kind of text manipulation and then take away some of the, the hard coding that you had to do. So uh, we're going to add some commentary in and we're going to say when it's the, the penguin that has the maximum bill length, we're going to say our state star baker is, and then we're going to pull in the individual penguin ID. Um, and we're going to say what species they're from, what island they live on, and say congratulations to them because that feels like the right thing to do to the, the penguin who has won the Penguin Bake Off. Um, and then we're going to find the one that's the runner up 
And similar kind of thing again, our runner up is a fill in the species name, the island, and put their name in. And we're going to put the name between two asterisks uh, either side, which makes the name go bold. Um, and then add a bit of silly text next to that because why not? And then for the last one, uh, again, same thing. We're going to pull in their name. Uh, we're going to say they didn't have a good baking day um, and a bit of funny text about that again. So we're just here, we're just creating the content for the boxes. But you can do this kind of stuff if you're creating a parameterized report and you want to add some commentary on the data that you're reporting on. Um, it's quite fun to do. And I recommend doing it inside a table, uh, inside, inside a table, because you can then apply everything um, across the whole thing. It makes it more consistent. Um, and then you can create yourself a kind of commentary column that you then pull in, uh, say, as bullet points or however you want to do it inside your text. Anyway, so we've got a commentary sorted for the penguins that we want to highlight. Um, and this is what it looks like. So we've got the individual ID, the species, the island. And then we've pulled all of those things together to create some sentences about them with a bit of formatting as well. Now we need to figure out where we want to put the labels. So these labels are going to be to highlight the star baker, who's up here. We're going to highlight the runner up, who's over here. And we're also going to highlight this poor penguin down here who did not have a good day in the tent. Um, and we've got a bit of space in our graph over here. We've got a bit of space over here and we've got a bit of space over here. So we can figure out what the coordinates of the box are going to be and uh, where they're going to line up within our graph. And then from that, we can then determine whether we want the text to line up to the right or to the left of the box um, and whether we want some arrows starting at the box and finishing at the data point, et cetera, et cetera. So, See that's on because we're going to do this all fairly quickly. Um, we are going to do a bit more housekeeping to arrange our penguins in the right order, mostly just so that we preserve our sanity when we're thinking about the star baker, the runner up, and then the penguin that had to exit. Um, and we are going to add in coordinates for our boxes. So we're going to say these are the x coordinates of our boxes that make the use of the space that we had. And um, these are the y coordinates of our boxes. And if you remember, the box ends up in the in the middle of that. Um, and then we're going to create a left to right alignment, which is conditional. So same thing as we did earlier with our guinea pigs and the bar graph. We're going to say if the label is to the left of where the uh, the point is of where the data point is on the x axis, we're going to align it one way. If the label is to the right of where the data point that we want to point out is, then we're going to line it up the other way. So we can create um, a left to right adjustment of, of our box um, to make that work nicely and of the text inside the box. Once we've done that, we also need to specify um, the arrows and where they're going to end. So again, we're going to say if the arrow is approaching from the right, we are going to cut it slightly short of that. And um, if it's approaching from the left, then we're going to make it land slightly short of the, the left point um, that, we're, that we're talking about. Um, and again, this is just, it's a small thing, but it means that your arrows look nicer and they land in the right place. Um, and no one gets distracted by the fact that you've got an arrow that's overlapping with a point and they remember that from your plot rather than remembering actually the main thing that you were trying to, to talk about. So let's have a go at adding all of that in. And so far, we've just got these text boxes that we added in earlier, which are the, the, the coordinate of the boxes, the mean um, on each of the axes within each group. And now we're going to add in some more fun stuff. So um, we are going to add in the Penguin Highlights data, which is what we talked about, with the commentary. So you can see the commentary um, is the text that has now appeared on our plot. Um, and it has appeared where we told it to, so where the label X and the label Y were, and the box um, is aligned left to right um, as well, depending on where we wanted it to, to sit relative to the data point. And we've given it the family again, we've changed the size, we've removed the fill, and we've removed the contour of the box. Um, and so we have our boxes sitting here. So we could leave it like that, but it's still a bit messy. They're a bit all over the place, and it would be nicer to, to tie them in. So let's add some arrows, um, which, again, is another thing. It's not as hard to do as people think it is, um, but it makes a big difference. Um, and I was surprised by how, um, how niche a skill this is. So hopefully, by telling you all how to do it, it becomes less niche. 
um, and uh, ggplot and R get known as the ways to, to do these easily and programmatically. So we're going to add in a curve uh, using jump curve. Um, and again, we're using the same data, penguin highlights, and the arrow starts at the box coordinate, and then it ends at the arrow X end, which is what we specified earlier, conditionally based on whether the arrow was approaching from one side or from the other. Same on the Y axis, the arrow starts at the Y coordinate of the box, and then it ends um, where we said it would. So what you can see is happening with this box is that the axis, uh, the coordinates of the box are here, where I'm pointing, hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, so the coordinates of the box are here, and then the arrow finishes just short of the point, both slightly underneath it and slightly to the left of it. Um, whereas this one, it finishes again slightly underneath it, but slightly to the right of it because of the conditional um, arrow ends that we put in. Um, here we finish slightly above it and slightly to the left again because of the conditional stuff. So, that's all fine, um, and it works okay, and we specified what we want our arrow to look like. You can create very large arrows or very small arrows, depending on what fits best. Um, you can change the curvature um, of your arrow as well to make it straight or more curvy, depending on what you want. Um, and I've also made the arrows uh, slightly transparent because I wanted the data points to stand out more than the arrows. Um, if we have them all at the same level of transparency, um, then the arrows are going to be just a little bit in your face compared to the, the data points. Um, and using transparency is really a useful way of doing that rather than having to figure out yet another color that you want to use um, because the transparency will naturally be a variant on a color that you already have. So we've got our arrows, we've got text boxes. Um, we still need to um, align the text inside the boxes. So we're going to reuse that left to right alignment that we have already used where is it? Here. So H just <clears throat> aligns the box, and then H align aligns the text inside the box. So not only have we got our box kind of matching up to the edge of the arrow, we've now also got the text inside it lining up to the edge of, of the, the edge of the arrow, which just makes it a little bit clearer what the arrows are coming from and what they're pointing to. Um, and I've also used the text inside the, you know, the alignment of the text to kind of force your eye in a particular direction when you're looking at it, or force your eye in the other direction, um, so that you start naturally looking at the points that your text is talking about. So there we go, we've done the alignment. Um, and again, we've highlighted some important patterns, and you can see the difference that it makes to, to the plot. Um, having some stuff on top of the plot, possibly slightly controversial, but can be really good, particularly if you're giving a presentation and you want people to get a really quick view of what's going on. What you could do is add those text boxes on and then move them off for the next slide. And by that point, people will remember what it is that you're talking about. Um, and then you can add it on. So yeah, don't, it's like PowerPoint, right? Just because you can do it, doesn't mean that you should do it. It's the same with these plots. Just because you can add all these text boxes in doesn't mean that you should, but hopefully you've now got a good idea of different options that you could use. Um, and how to do it, and also bits that where you might, you know, where it might fall apart, and how to avoid that. Um, again, so again, why wait? But why on earth would you do this? Again, because once you set it up, even the arrows um, can move nicely to the different data points that you want them to move to. So it saves you that hassle of you've got new data and you've got to start again, um, and means that it all it all kind of works. Um, I did that recently for this is the most recent Tidy Tuesday that I have done, um, where I created the, the initial plot and used all these kind of text alignment techniques that we're talking about, used some transparency in the text. Um, and then just for the fun of it, turned it into a function and allowed you to feed in two different countries as the starting point. And as you can see, the, the text down the side of it um, does the right thing. You know, it moves around as it needs to. Um, the alignments stay consistent um, and it just works. So this this just saves you a lot of time. Um, you know, the penguin stuff is silly. The, the guinea pig stuff, I think it's based on real science, but it's, it's probably a little bit silly for the purposes of what we're doing today. Um, but you can, you can use this um, however easy or however complex or simple the data set, um, you can create these kind of things um, that allow you to, to easily reproduce um, the same plot again with different data, with all the alignments and the, the text boxes working where you need them to, um, and all the design stuff and the text hierarchy and the colors and you know all the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, it just makes it all work. So these are the two plots that we've created today, um, and hopefully 
this has been uh, there's been some useful stuff there um which has helped uh, you figure out what you want to do next how you want to uh, tackle your next plot what you can use etc and um, but once you've got to this point you know the possibilities are endless you can start manipulating stuff in whichever way you want so here are two more tidy tuesday ones um this well the one with the bird is a lot of geom these are all text boxes so this is all gg text geom text box all lined up on top of each other um yeah with the coordinate that it needed to fit in based on ranking or however I did it, I don't know. But yeah, it's all text boxes. I tend to also use text boxes for the title and the subtitle if I want them to sit kind of inside the plot rather than sitting over the top of it. And um, same thing here. Um, and the fun thing with this one, which was a total accident, uh, but that I kept because I liked it. Um, so this isn't actually a plot margin. It's just that I made rectangles to specify the time and I got the top of the rectangle wrong. Uh, but it means that the data pokes out over the top of it. And actually, I think that's a really fun effect to keep that. So experiment with things and make mistakes because sometimes you make a mistake and it actually turns out much better than what you had intended to do um, in the first place. We've also got, as you can see, some text and um, color styling inside it that highlights the story, um, which again means that I didn't need a legend um, and I could easily point out you know the Lego friends stuff appeared here the Star Wars stuff appeared here um yeah this is quite a fun one to to work on and um, you can also add a bunch of arrows and lines and straight arrows and make them start and finish wherever you want to and um, it's just fun you, you have have fun with it um the this I think the penguin one Probably a 30 day chart challenge. I can't remember. The, this one with the daylight hours and ember was definitely a 30 day chart challenge. So, again, there are plenty of kind of peer and um, community um, activities that happen online where you get to create these kind of things based on data. The 30 day chart challenge, you have to source your own data. Um, but that's quite fun uh, sometimes, although sometimes you end up spending more time trying to get hold of the data that you want than you do actually creating the plot. Tidy Tuesday, the data comes with it, um, and it's typically tidy. Um, which is nice, so you don't have to faff around too much with the data, you can just focus on the plotting. Um, and the community around these two events is really, really friendly. Um, so I you know, I love the NHSR community because I think there's something really special about the fact that it's such a supportive community and you're all trying to help each other and um, do better with what you're doing. And I, I think that's just that's just brilliant. Um, and to me, the, the RStats um, ID Tuesday crowd was what I needed at that point in my career to get the feedback that I needed in a really supportive environment as well. So if you're looking to upskill on your data viz, um, I really I highly recommend getting involved with that. Um, the feedback is always, you know, no one, no one is gonna nitpick at stuff They're like, oh, you should have, why did you do this this way? And um, no, everyone's really helpful. And sometimes they'll post something and say, I couldn't get it to do this, and someone will give you the answer um, in a comment. And um, so again, it's just it's just a really really fun thing and you can also um if you get really into this have a look at gg animate and create some rather silly things um this one was about uh obviously it wasn't ufos it was un unidentified feral animals that were found um but anyway i thought it was fun to, to put some aliens on it and uh, sometimes emojis are actually useful when you're creating a plot um to help people remember what it is that you're, you're plotting so there's lots and lots of different ways to do that um and you can find the code for all of these in my Tidy Tuesday um, repo, which I can I can share a link to that as well, um, if you want to. So there we go. We have made it to um, the end of the materials that I had to share um, with you guys. Um, I hope that it's been a helpful workshop. I had a lot of fun um, putting it together. Um, and at this point, it's really over to you to, to work on your own plots, your own creations. And do, do reach out, as I said, if you're working on something and you just got stuck on something and you can't figure it out, um, have it, send me an email, that's absolutely fine. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. I'll just post, I'll just pop a wee um, link to my profile there. Now do connect up and um, it would be great to, to see you there. Um, and I, I regularly post um, Tidy Tuesday stuff, plots, but also things that, random things that I get excited about. And um, if I, you know, if I'm coding something in R and suddenly this thing that didn't make sense makes sense, I, I post that. And um, it's genuine enthusiasm that comes across. I'm not out there to, you know, 
sell stuff to people and um, through LinkedIn. I'm just there to add stuff into the community um, and to help people do better with their database. So do uh, do connect and follow, that would be great. Um, and the other thing to highlight is I'm giving another talk in this conference next week um, on data viz design systems. If what I said about it in this piqued your interest and you cannot wait till then, um, I've just posted a link there to a talk that I did um, in a, in a, another conference uh, on the same thing. I'm going to be expanding on that talk this time around and adding things in like tables and talking about other things that you can do uh, once you've got your database design system loaded up. Um, yeah, it would be would be great to see you there. Um, but yeah, we've got a bit of time. So um, if anyone has a question or a kind of, oh, I wish she'd said she, I thought she was going to talk about this and she didn't. Um, now's your time uh, to to ask that burning question. Um, and if not, you're free to go, and I will I will hopefully bump into you again, um, either in person or online. I'm going to finish the recording by thanking you for such a tremendously. <laughs> interesting workshop. I didn't code along, but I didn't need to. I really enjoyed it. Oh, and you. what I'll do is I'll end the recording and then the questions can come okay. a little bit easier, I think, afterwards. So thank you.